The scientific revolution starts now. I am Dr. Bruce Daver. I, I have a position at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and I'm also the chief scientist of the Biota Institute. And we look at the question of how life can begin, uh, not in a uh, religious or mythological perspective, but in a full scientific, let's explain and connect all the dots perspective. And where does it possibly begin on Earth? Because we have one data point, we have life on Earth, and we, we can sort of read its, its record, we can read the rock record uh, back about 3.5, 3 3.7 billion years. We have our sister planets, we have Mars, where we've been looking for signs of life and we, we've read its early history. So where can life start and how does it start? And if you can restart or start the process of starting life or what's called an abiogenesis in the laboratory. And then if it works in the laboratory, if the first few steps seem to work in the laboratory, can you go out into the field, into landscapes on Earth, which would have been there four billion years ago, and try the chemistry there. So, our group, which is uh, with Dave David Deemer, who's a really well-known membrane biophysicist, we've been doing this for he's been doing it for decades, uh, and I've been working with him for fifteen years. And how I got into this was I was just a nerdy kid in the seventies fascinated with this question of how do things start and become more complex. And we had no computers in our town. But when I got hold of computers, I started writing coding algorithms and that were emergent processes. I was just completely obsessed with this. And I had some visions when I was 14 or 15 to work on the origin of life. And I knew I would get to it. Uh, but I did a career in computing and in research. And then I did uh, 15 years of work with NASA on spacecraft mission designs and simulation and all these wonderful things. And I finally, in 2009, met Dave Deemer and seriously got to start working on Origin of Life because he provided the mentorship and training and entree into this field, this sort of rarefied field of about 200 people that are working on this problem. And it's been super productive. Uh, and that's what we can get into some of the some of the super productive uh, results that have resulted in a kind of paradigm shift of of thinking, humanity's thinking of how how the creation, you know, the, the true scientific creation might have gone down. Why do you think that it's such a like belligerent field where people are just really up in arms about their particular stance on this topic? Why? What What are the high stakes in this field? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question, as I know there have been books written about the origins field where meetings were described where fistfights broke out. Now, I have to let the audience know that that actually happens in physics. It, it, it probably doesn't happen in, in a lot of other fields, but it does happen in, it happens in fields where there's a huge reliance on speculation. Mm. So if there's less data and less things that work, you end up in mental modeling and guesswork. And then people can get fixated on their, what Dave describes as they fall in love with their idea. And what we're seeing in the field now is a shift from those that have been in love with fairly conjectural ideas being replaced by actual science, actual chemistry being done in, in analogs, actual protocells being uh, assembled and formed spontaneously uh there's actual things there's work to do now so the that period of the fist fights while well, colorful uh, uh is in the past really of the origins field and in fact the ISIL organization the international society of study of origin of life has just had their meeting uh just finished in quito ecuador first time in the southern hemisphere and it was a very collegial meeting our postdoc went with his wife and it was just everyone in the same room talking and excited and, and sharing. So I think the, the fist fighting days, the boxing days are past uh, because we're now into data, we're into experiments. 
Why is the origin of life important? Now, that is a good question. I, I think it's, it's an existentially important question because for all of human history, at least as long as we've had language and we've been able to tell each other stories, we've had creation myths. We've, as a species, we seem to have to have that, to know where we came from. Was it Turtle Island or the dream time of the aboriginals in Australia? Was it, you know, the creation myths in Adam and Eve? Now, that's not the creation myths of life itself. Some religious uh, indigenous traditions do have mythology around the actual beginning of life, not just the beginning of humans. But it, it seems to be primal. We know where we come from. Uh, and what we're finding is that as we get closer and closer to plausible models for how life emerges, the story becomes more and more potent, less abstract, and it becomes more meaningful. So in our group, for example, uh, people have shown up at the door uh, because we're we're forming these things called protocells uh, in hot spring settings, analogs to hot spring settings in the lab and then at real hot springs. And a philosopher showed up uh, who's working on whiteheads process philosophy because there's some things in our chemical model, our cycle and chemical model that inform, that actually connect into philosophy at a deep level for the first time in, in decades, perhaps, that philosophy perhaps has found a hinge point into what you might call the hard sciences. Can you uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. And let me, you know, before we sort of dive into all the implications, uh, I'd love to paint a picture for the audience of what we're talking about. So we're sort of dancing around. And and if that's all right. Yeah, of course, please. So the, the picture that we kind of like to start with is imagining the Earth 4.1 billion years ago. If you were to don an environment suit with an oxygen supply, because you would have to, and go through a time portal back to this planet, which was an alien world, it would be completely unrecognizable to, to us, to an explorer through time. Because it was this, you know, the Earth formed around 4.5, 4.57 billion years ago, and had had this collision event with a a planet-sized body that science is named Thea, that then created the moon in this freakishly rare type of an event, uh, and then it it had it had to sort of coalesce and cool for a while again. That's why it was sort of late to the game. Mars got cool and became solid earlier, and then it went through this period where uh, the atmosphere rained out all that vapor that was released by boiling, you know, hot magmatic uh, rock. And you had oceans forming and you had huge hydrothermal systems and you had huge volcanoes. So volcanoes are guaranteed to be around because that's the mantle is blowing off heat. And there are volcanoes create these massive island structures or even full sort of continent sized structures. So here you have it, you're in an environment where uh, you don't have the, uh, the sort of lighter weight granitic continents, but you have volcanic island chains and protocontinents, and you have a coffee-colored ocean because it's so full of iron. Uh, there's a lot of iron in, in, in the environment. We still see that on Mars. Uh, and then you have perhaps an orange or pink sky uh, where you have very different gas composition in the atmosphere, no free oxygen to breathe. and you have uh, raining down. So in, in the solar system, you have our planet. If you stood there uh, coming out of your time portal and you looked up by daylight, you would have seen this disks, these glowing rings from horizon to horizon surrounding our sun. And this is the accretion disk and the dust materials and ice particles and, and uh, meteor, you know, asteroidal material that the planets are vacuuming up. And Kepler and Tess and other missions, and now James Webb, sees these accretion disks, these protoplanetary disks, with planets vacuuming up material. So there's like a band, a dark band. And our planet would have been vacuuming up this material, and it would have been 
raining down as big impactors and medium-sized ones and dust particles like snowflakes. And into that environment, you know, organics are falling. So we now know that organic material is coming in from the sky. And if you go up into your gutters of your house, you'll find micrometeorites that have fallen the previous you know, year that you haven't cleaned your gutters. You'll literally find them, but they're still coming in. And so along all of that, you've got this big coffee-colored ocean, and this material falls into the ocean. It just dilutes. It just uh, sort of falls to the bottom, and material comes off, and it's a very big bulk. So you can't really get any chemistry going. So we, we chatted about this earlier, wrestling with or origins in an ocean, which this sort of doesn't really work because you've got too much water. So you actually need a Goldilocks situation. You need, you need some water and, some, and, and access to air and some land and a certain type of environment that can lift things into complexity. So our, our little astronaut comes out on a volcanic landscape, is crunching along a lava field like you'd find in Hawaii, and comes upon a volcano that is 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 no is now dormant but at the base of the volcano and perhaps in the caldera there are bubbling hot springs and those hot springs come from rainfall that falls down gets into chambers underneath just like you'd find at yellowstone or kamchatka or uh, other places and it heats up into like they're like it's like a tea kettle it sort of boils and then regularly you get these bursts called geysers, that's an Icelandic word, uh, and these pulses of water are coming out on a periodic basis, and they fill pools, and then the pools drain or dry down, and it happens again, and it's literally like Old Faithful, every 73 minutes for, you know, decades, and it's that engine, that's the clue, this repeated flow, and if you, if you look down at these pools, you'll see that there are different colors. Some are acidic and some are alkaline in terms of their pH. Different chemicals have leached out. Different things from the sky have fallen and concentrated. And you'll find the, the astronaut or the timonaut would find a sludge around the pool's edge. And that sludge, uh, if you actually scoop it up, so say, for instance, there's a, a geologist there in their, in their suit and next to a biologist. And they're in the prebiotic earth, so there's no life yet. But life perhaps is starting, and they're trying to find out where it starts. So the geologist takes his rock hammer and scrapes the sludge up and says, Oh, I understand the lava, the I understand the mafic uh, lava that's here, and I understand the geology of what I see. But this sludge, since I can't break it with my hammer, I don't call it geology. It's something else. It's just a sludge. But the biologist, what she does is said, give it to me. You know, I'll put it into a microscope. I'll look at it. Oh, it's lipids. It's membrane. It's a silvery slick of material that seems to be coming from all the dust particles. And meteorites are releasing this stuff into our little soup pot in the hot spring. And it's layered. And there are little bulbous things coming off of it. And in between the layers are bits and pieces of organic material that get trapped. And she said, well, let's come back in a million years. Let's, let's just go for lunch back in human time, and we'll come back a million years later to the same location. The landscape should be still here. We won't fall into a, a chasm or something. So they come back, and they go crunch, 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 and they find that the hydrothermal pools have shifted. They're all in different locations, but they're still cranking away. And she immediately notices a change, that that sludge is now black. It's black. It's like pigmented in some way. It's not as silvery. So she scrapes it up and puts it through a nanopore sequencer, which is a technology that my colleague uh, Dave Deemer invented. It's a little handheld uh, sequencing device. And she notices short little things called polymers. and. The polymers are made out of nucleic acid building blocks called nucleotides. 
They may not be exactly the ones that we know for life, but there are short polymers and they're repeating and they're doing something. So then she goes into a full AI simulation of what is going on in the sludge now and finds a little circuit has formed where the meteorite uh, material, which is called, and I can actually sniff this here, this material here, as you can see a little bit in the bottom of this vial, this is from an asteroid meteorite that fell on the Earth a few decades ago called the Murray meteorite, and it has a lot of carbonaceous material in it. And if I sniff this, I can smell it. Uh, polycyclic hydrocarbons and amino acids are in here, carboxylic acids are here, and nucleobases. Hey everybody, hopefully you are listening to this thinking, how can I make this show go even further, grow even bigger, become a better and better and more powerful platform to ask questions about nature? Well, come on over to our Patreon page and consider joining the community there. It's actually a really, really powerful tight-knit community. We get together once a week and hash out new ideas for what we should be exploring and all things pertaining to how to make this a better experience. If you don't have any cash right now, maybe just come over to Discord and chat it up with us, or check out our Facebook page, or just leave a comment down below. And you could also consider blocking off the weekend of April 6th and 7th next year, where we're going to be having our first conference. First Demystify Sci Conference, which will coincide with the totality of the eclipse, which is passing through very close to Austin, Texas, at that exact same moment. We look forward to talking to you and hearing your ideas and enjoy the rest of the conversation with Bruce Damer. What's that smell like? Like like gasoline or something? It is like... It's like a smoky... It's like a smell you've never smelled before. Hmm. It's like a deep, deep time smell. Smoky, gunpowdery. Like Grandpa's Attic or something? Even deeper. And and this is 4.6 billion years old. This is older than Earth. So that we know this material was falling in. Mm-hmm. And and what's beautiful about origin science now is that we actually, it's less guesswork. It's less hand-waving conjecture. We know that this material was falling in. If we, if we take some of this and put it into water, we see membranes come out of it. Uh, there's 70 amino acids on board this right now. So uh, they're nucleobases, but other groups have now shown pathways to nucleotide formation using ultraviolet radiation. This is the work of John Sutherland and Matt Powner in Cambridge. So the piece is like, oh, the warm little pond idea that Charles Darwin had in his letter to uh, T.J. Hooker in 1871, where he talks about, oh, but what a, a big if, some warm little pond somewhere all sorts of phosphoric salts, electricity, et cetera, came together such that, this is, this is where Charles Darwin nailed it 150 years ago, a protein compound shall form ready to undergo more complex changes. He nailed it. What he's describing there is a polymer of amino acids. This is, not, this is Victorian science. They, they knew about proteins. They did not know about nucleic acids but a polymer which un- is ready to undergo more complex changes. What that might mean is to get longer, bigger, have more complex structure, and that implies cycling, a system that can make that protein and let it undergo what he might later call or had called natural selection, a form of selection through cycling, undergoing complex changes in the future. So Darwin was pointing to this in 1871. And the field went through all kinds of different, you know, we had Miller and Urey and the spark chamber experiments of the 50s. And we had a thought about oil slicks on the ocean surface. And then the hydrothermal vents were discovered in the 70s. And all of that was really good science and good information, but it was actually the wrong setting. The setting actually is the warm little pond. Well, why? Because Warm means you have, uh, you know, energy for reactions. You know, if you have a warm flask, you get faster reactions. Uh, little means you get concentration, uh, sufficient concentration for things to happen. The ocean or a lake, 
or any kind of large water body is going to di disperse material. So you do not have concentration. And his call for a cycling system to form polymers is precisely right. And what we've done to sort of bring uh, his warm little pond into the 21st century is imagine a hot little cycling pool of that 4.1 billion year old landscape, you know, where the astrobiologist, she picks up the, the goop, notices that it's black, and notices that something is happening there with polymers templating, making copies of stuff, and uh, making functional things, making a pigment. And then the pigment is capturing sun, solar energy, and also protecting the community of protocells. The sludge is made up of protocells from too much UV exposure, which could be harmful, but you need some of it to get the chem chemistry going. So a form of photosynthesis is going on with a completely combinatorially selected free gene. There's no genes in this system. It's 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 chemical evolution that's happening with a templated structure. This is before the ribosome, before the big protein stamping machinery. And she declares to her geologist colleague that it's not alive, but it has lifelike properties of biology. And so between their lunchtime, pre-lunchtime visit, where they saw just self-assembled membranous structures with random polymers and random sugars and things like that that were available. And after lunch, they noticed a million years later, uh, protocells undergoing polymeric evolution and that there's more of it. So as they walk around the hydrothermal field, they see the, the black sludge is everywhere. There may be a pool with silver sludge that hasn't really gotten the memo yet about making a photo capture system. But very soon, like if she scooped up if she took the black sludge and introduced it into the pool with the silver sludge, it would all go black because they've shared a proto a quasi genetic innovation across the landscape. And they would stand there realizing this is it. This is a combinatorial landscape powerful enough to support a way from equilibrium evolution, proto evolution toward the emergence of the robust microbial community. And one of the things that she would have is the great insight that's a philosophical insight was, wait a minute, what we're not seeing here is an individual protocell competing with another. They're all in aggregates. They bud off when the wetting comes, water comes in and the dried film phase buds off new protocells. You get reproduction for free, a form of budding. And we watch them Basically, they're stable or not during the hydrated phase. And then we watch them re-aggregate at the bottom of the pool into a complex. And then they start to share material because protocells fuse when they dry down. You can, you can watch that under a microscope. And material is shared. You get back into layered form and you have synthesis through dehydration, through literally water leaving. It pulls protein or pet, uh, amino acids together and uh, nucleic acid together to do what are called condensation reactions. And we, we've demonstrated, many groups have now demonstrated, it's a standard practice called wet-dry cycling. It's sort of swept our field as the key, key chemical thing to do to get things to happen. That's why there are fewer fist fights. So she, what she realizes is the origin of life is, is, a, is the origin of a communal complex. There is no common ancestor in the protocell world because they don't have identity. Uh, like what Carl Woese described in his progenote uh, hypothesis that everything is amorphous and shared in the beginning. So evolution is rapid because cells don't own their own genes. They don't own their own machinery. It's a, it's a communal thing. So you get this massive spike of polymeric evolution before the emergence of the distinct dividing, you know, fissioning cell that now owns its genetic complement. And that becomes, you know, the, the origin of bacteria, you know, perhaps archaea or, but it's all done in a community complex. None of this is, is, is free living, divisible uh, protocells 
to early living cells. It's communal complexes in relationship. And so she kind of realizes before they go back for dinner, you know, that a core discovery has been made in that the origin of life is the origin of the stromatolite, in a sense, the oldest, you know, fossils that we can see in the record. So here's stromatolites, 3.5 billion years. This is a new discovery. It's actually not even publication. These little red spherules are layered, balled up microbial mat that was balled up in a, a fissure or vent on the landscape uh, that got filled with barite mineral and froze them in place. Hmm. And, and so that's a stromatolite uh, from three and a half billion years ago. This is even more remarkable. This is a little spalling of uh, geyserite. So on the, on the margins of, it's really hard to see with these cameras, is layered uh, black and white uh, uh, geyserite, which is a mineral that's produced by splattering. And in this geyserite, uh, which is evidence of a hot spring three billion, three and a half billion years ago, are, is evidence for life, including little silica spherules that are evidence for oxygenic uh, metabolism. Hmm. So this is, this, is, this is as far back as we've been able to, to look for life, and we find robust communities in terrestrial freshwater environments. So the, can I back you? Can I back you up about these precursor things too? Because we kind of started with these amino acids and and protopolymers. Are those forged in molecular clouds? What's the prevailing theory for like where the one that's coming inside the chondrite? Just the things that are raining down. Yeah. Yeah. So the stuff that's coming from outer space. Outer space. Yeah. What's going on with that? Do you have any insight into it? Yeah. I mean, there's a a vast new field of sort of roughly could be called cosmochemistry. Uh, for example, two expensive and very high risk, high reward missions have been flown to asteroids and one to a comet in the last five years. And the Japanese Ryugu uh, uh, return, sample return uh, has, has you know been processed and it's full of water and it's full of organic materials. And the American uh, Osiris Rex will be returning, uh, I think, next year or the year after. Large samples, you're talking grams, which is pretty extraordinary. And so we know from that, we know from exoplanet or exosolar system imaging that abundant organics are produced in the process of forming a solar system. And so the old issue of how do we get a supply of amino acids into the system because Life has to live on a free lunch until it can make its own amino acids. And in fact, you and I, we still can't make certain amino acids. We, you know, we're we're parasites on another system so that we can get fundamental building blocks. But life uh, eventually learns how to make its own cell boundaries, its own uh, nucleic acids for information. Life has to become autopoetic and, and it has to synthesize its own stuff. But in the beginning, that's the chicken and egg. It can't do that. There are no enzymes to do any of that. So you need to actually have a system where you're fed uh, on a pretty regular basis before the system through selection ends up replacing the external exogenous source with an endogenous manufacturing of, of that compound. And that's you know, a... I've been I've been thinking about this a lot where if there is exogenous amino acids, nucleic acids, and all these other things that are scattered through the solar system. So basically every time that we look out into something that's floating around in space, we discover that it has more organics in it than we expected. Because back in the day, I think that there was the idea that it was sterile in outer space, that it was mostly hydrogen, that you weren't going to find anything complex. And now we're realizing that as planets form, as these bodies form, they're chock full of organics. And Like we even stopped calling uh, petro, car uh, what do they used to call it? Fossil um, fuels. Fossil fuels, that's right. Yeah, because they started finding them on other planets, right? And so there's this gradual realization that, okay, so hydrocarbons, not just something that is produced by life, must be ample in the universe. Okay, so... 
Why do we even need the raining down of external organics to seed the earth if it is forming in a protoplasmic cloud of organic material that is around the sun? Now here's the, the, the direct answer to that is when you're a magma ball, so you're, you're, you're mostly rocky material, those organics are very friable. They're gone. So a planet that is cooling has basically any of the organics in the environment are just gone. They're baked off. They're turned into kerogen. Like they're turned into to soot, to basically sooty, burnt black material. So you actually have to wait until you have a solid surface that isn't going to destroy all the organics. And then you have to get the infall, the load that comes, the delivery that comes. And people have proposed comets for delivering uh, Earth's water in the past. It probably the water came from just the, the cooling of, of magma and all it's that. Inter really it's interesting because, you know, Oparin, who I noticed you cited in, in one of the papers you sent us, he, he had this conception that as the magma cooled, that the chemistry would produce some of these precursors itself. And I, I don't know if people have followed up on that or whatever, but... It, yeah, it, those the, the ideas from those years really, really have been long since supplanted. So, for example, uh, Stanley Miller, Miller and Uri in the 1950s, in the early 50s, you know, showing a reducing atmosphere in a spark chamber methane and ammonia that they could produce and in fact it was a lot larger number of amino acids just by sparking the chamber so that actually launched a new that launched the origin of life as a science rather than just a speculation so the spark chamber experiments were repeated over and over and over again and showed that yeah fairly large volumes of these feedstocks can be produced and delivered to to the earth uh, given that processes on the earth, I mean, if you go to, uh, say, a volcanic environment today, fresh material, you're not going to find, you're going to find mineral leaching and materials coming out, but you're not going to find large organic production there. Uh, it's just not conducive. And in any environment which has sort of, it's basically all the material degrades pretty quickly. So you have to have a feed source. And some of it can be through Strecker synthesis in a hydrothermal pool, for example. So hydrothermal pools, it, it can have, uh, or even a vent, can have enough concentration, enough energy sources. You can produce some organics from below, effectively, and, and feed the system. You can produce a lot of activated compounds, too, as energy sources, redox sources. Uh, but for the bigger organics, like an amino acid, that's probably just not going to be a, an option sort of for an endogenous production on the earth. And we may not need that because we have such an abundant infall of this material uh, from a larger pool, uh, which is the accreting solar system. So I know that a lot of the criticism of the Miller-Urey experiment was that they had mistaken the conditions of the early earth where they would basically, I think that it was that the atmosphere in the experiment was too reducing, and now we think that there was more of a neutral atmosphere, and so now there's this big debate as to whether or not it was possible to actually create amino acids the way that Miller-Urey proposed. Is that, would you, is that an accurate description? There are many, many schools of thought, and one of them uh, arising through, I'd like to cite the work of Ben Pierce, who's now at Johns Hopkins, uh, was at McMaster uh, Origins Institute, uh, they studied Titan's atmosphere. So Titan's atmosphere is extremely organoproductive. Right? We see methane lakes and we, we see basically tars. Uh, you mentioned the, the ubiquity of organics. And for the listening audience, when we talk about organic compounds, we don't mean those created by living systems. We just mean things that are built around the built, uh, cores of carbon. Mm. Uh, so by studying the photochemistry in Titan's atmosphere and then mapping over to Earth in a post-impact uh, period where the atmosphere really has changed out very quickly. You have a six, seven, eight kilometer impactor that uh, vaporizes, say, the photic upper uh, layer of the ocean. So you get a huge amount of, of water vapor and heat. 
uh, you can have conditions a little bit like Titans, where now you're, you're in a sense, it's almost like a biogenic atmosphere. It's producing uh, organics at a much higher rate for a period of time. So there, there are those models as, as well. So there Did are, you see this uh, paper that came out in Nature, I think, last... No, it was this year, uh, where they were proposing that the there was this thick hydrogen envelope that surrounded the Earth, which actually resulted in the production of the oceans. I thought it was really fascinating. I was talking with the, the first author for a little while, but we didn't, didn't manage to get him on the show yet. Yeah, the, they're, they're sort of, in a sense, you could actually now classify all these sources as putative, you know, uh, potential uh, demonstrated sources, like the, this is a, a demonstrated source. This, mm -hmm. this is really guaranteed that this was happening. Uh, and then some of the, so you put it all together, perhaps, and that's where we, we say, do we have, we certainly, we have sources. We don't we'll probably never know what the, the primary driving source was. But we can work with uh, stuff that's in, within plausi range of plausibility. I guess the the theory was it is. I guess it is based on a lot of observations, but they're of exoplanetary systems, and they're like when we look at all these rocky planets, they have these thick atmospheres that they're losing essentially. And so we hadn't thought about that before, but it probably plays some part in this mystery. Yeah, I mean, we're going. That's the beauty. If we can actually get some basic uh, spectra from exoplanet atmospheres and we were down at SETI Institute and there's a scientist who's a member of their their group was talking about the difficulty of getting spectra from atmospheres it's flat they're really not getting good spectral reads mm. you so can't see the right. little rocky ones too very well is the problem from what I understand we, we you can't know, we, so we have to use the big guys right so we have to use modeling uh but it's it's certainly better data than we've had ever in our the history of this science. Models of exoplanets and you know habitable zones and whether or not the star you know can think can life form around a brown dwarf or a red dwarf because of the you know the radiation regimes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, 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 there's so much. I mean, this thing is such a multivariate uh, challenge. Yeah, I think the concept of planetary evolution is somewhat new and really exciting right now because I think until we had access to other planetary systems, we only had our own. And so we assumed that planetary formation kind of happened in situ. And then, you know, for the last century, people have been playing around with how to get the different planets to appear right where they do and so forth. But it's kind of shocking because most pla planetary systems are homogenous. Like most of the planets all look the same. I think 90% of them, maybe it's 75%, the majority of these solar systems have the same type of planet in them. Ours seems to be really strange and unique and, and evolved in this interesting way. And a great and, book, a great book for listeners to look at is Brownlee and Ward's book, Rare Earth, which uh, was published in 1999, but it has a second edition. And these two authors pull all the factors together to argue that the Earth is actually an extraordinarily rare. A system and our solar system is also rare and then all of the the things that had to happen for life to even be possible are rare so for example the maintenance of a volatile uh, liquid water on the surface for four billion years is never guaranteed mars you know it mars dried out it froze the atmosphere was lost Volatile uh, water on Mars will last for less than a second. If you poured a cup of water on the surface, it would just sublimate immediately. Mm -hmm. And so, and of course, Venus, if it had oceans, they they were evaporated quickly into the and boiled off into the atmosphere. So, the Earth just having oceans, just all oh, they just hang around uh, to sustain a biosphere that becomes more complex is an extraordinary event. It's not the norm at all, and that. If life got started on Mars or Venus, uh, the planet itself, and this is an important thing for people to understand, planets effectively die out from under any system. So, for example, if you have microbiota, if you have the sludges on Mars and the little pools that develop into microbial communities and start 
patterning down stromatolites, guess what? That was only for the first 500 million years. And then Mars became uninhabitable, became sterilizing at the surface. So the only life we're going to find on Mars is in the rocks and hot, wet rocks, thermophilic halophiles, basically, uh, microbial communities, uh, maybe some under the ice uh, at, the, at the margins, but Mars is an evolutionary stopping point. Uh, so complex life like eukaryotes from prokaryotes has probably never happened on Mars. I give it a, a one in five chance that microbial life ever emerged there. Hmm. And what we're doing now uh, from our group and with colleagues is we're creating a new framework for science, for astrobiology called urability. So we have habitability, which is worlds that we think because they have liquid water on the surface could sustain life as we know it. Urability is a world that can start life. And it has really different features. So Mars today is not urable. You could not start life on Mars. They're, they're just in, of the 28 factors we identified, uh, Mars now has very few of them for getting pre uh, prebiotic chemistry to work on the on the surface, especially uh, an ocean world probably is inurable too. And this is something that's happening within the search for life community, if you will, that an ice covered say a world like Enceladus, which is a huge mm -hmm. ice uh, shell on an interior ocean lacks many of the factors for our ability to start life. And by or we mean the German uh, stem word first or, or uh, you know, the city of or or Urschleim, which was Hans uh, the Heckel's uh, 19th century description of the origin origin life came from an Urschleim, a slime that was the first slime. It's kind of a very interesting concept. So what about, the vents that, what about the vents that people are, are latched onto? Yeah, I was, I was just about to ask that because we have the warm little pond has the small membrane encapsulated reaction vessels, but the hydrothermal vents have flow chambers and they also have areas that are isolated from the larger pool of the ocean. And so why are you so down on the hydrothermal vents? Well, the, the, the reason that, that our colleagues are really questioning this is thermodynamic. So for example, yes, uh, flow reactors can perform some chemistry and build up from CO2, fix CO2, and build up some uh, organic precursors. Uh, in a realistic vent simulation, they've never demonstrated a path all the way to amino acids. There's always been something added that was implausible. If you can get to that point, and certainly vents grow chimneys, so they're doing geology. They're actually creating reasonably complex structures. Uh, but as soon as you have that product, you're subject to hydrolysis, the back reaction. If you're in water, you are facing what's called the water paradox or the water problem coined by Steve Benner, which is life needs water to exist, but to get it started, you know, but, but life has enzymes to fix the repair and the damage of hyd hydrolysis and depurination and all these things. So to get life started, if you have water around, you form a polymer, it breaks up. Uh, everything is getting broken up and pulled apart because there's a strong hydrolytic effect. So unless you can somehow remove water, you can't form condensation bonds because you don't have an enzyme to do it, so you're stuck. So it's kind of a, a circular argument. And for 30 years, the hydrothermal vent research teams have never shown the creation of complex organics in any of their simulations. And one of the challenges that was given by our group was, why don't you try working this in the field? Take a submersible, place some, some precursors into the bottom of one of these vents and attempt to capture them coming out the top. Or perhaps even uh, will they rest and become concentrated in one of these chambers? And that's very hard to do. And most of our colleagues would say, well, it would never work. And salt water uh basically prevents membrane formation 
the salt water crystallizes membranes. So the idea of a small cell size compartment, which we think you need to have to support all of the chemistry, just can't work in, in salty ocean water. Hmm. So colleagues but like in that Kat, case, Kat, go ahead. So it was something that I've always wondered is, in that case, why can't the compartment itself be the rock? It, could you have a pore in the rock that is the size of a cell that is the reaction chamber? Well, here's, yes, you could. Uh, group, uh, there was a colleague at University College London actually built with an aluminum, sort of a foamed aluminum, made one of these sort of simulated rock pore chambers and really was unable to get much out of it. Well, it seems like if you make it out of aluminum, you wouldn't get very much out of it because that's not, because I think that this, the substance that the chamber is made of has to be directly related to the processes that you're studying and the crust of the earth isn't particularly, I mean, there is aluminum in there, but it's not like solid yeah, aluminum. Yeah, it's not a, a really a realistic simulant. And so if you were doing something with basalt, if you were doing something with serpentine, with olivine, with all of these rocks that are down there, and you were doing it under high pressure, and you were doing it under high temperature, and you were doing it with hydraulic fracturing so that the water could percolate through the pores, I just, I feel like you would basically have a four and a half billion year old nanoscale microfab reaction chamber. You would. You absolutely would, and you would get products out of this chamber. The question is, what then? So you're in a flow reactor. You're in a non-cycling system. So the products are produced. They might adhere or be adsorbed onto the mineral surface, but there's a continuous flow through, and there's also equilibrium with the bulk water. So you can't get things that are, ever become too complex because Equilibrium with the bulk means that you've got hydrolysis and things are breaking down. So you'll reach a plateau where you'll just be producing a slurry of organic products that are mostly going to be dispersed into the ocean. And a few of them may collect within these pores, but there is no system that has at least been proposed to cycle that system in molecular evolution through, through cycles of stresses, selection, resynthesis. So right. our colleagues usually are just focused on getting to any kind of large complex organics within their models. Mm -hmm. I think the cycling would have to be seismic in nature. Like you have these isolated pores and they come into contact through the rock crunching and different chambers being exposed to one another repeatedly, something like that, which might be far-fetched, but... It is a least... pretty, it's pretty far-fetched. Um, if, if one compares, so if you literally take hydrothermal vents and place them into a subaerial environment, this is what Martin Van, Van Krenendonk, uh, who is our colleague, our geologist colleague in Australia, calls vents with benefits. <laughs> if you move the vents onto land, you suddenly have an incredibly chemically rich environment. Uh, which also supports cycling. It supports wet dry or the wet dry process to actually make polymers. It gives you access to exogenous organics. It's it's tremendously rich. And what what we've done and our colleagues have done is said let's let's go back. Let's go back to the warm little pond and try things. You know, with real meteoritic materials or derivatives. And we're forming protocells with polymers of RNA, DNA self assembling within these pro protocells and other groups are doing peptide uh, formation, many, many groups and getting results. And we're getting up the ladder toward where that wonderful biologist in our, our story, we can get to the point where we see the emergence of proto-biological functions. If we can build a system either in the laboratory, probably best in the laboratory, our, our system over at the SETI Institute, we call it the Genesis engine, because it has 24 vials like this. It is rotating around on a multi-hour cycle, getting inje injected with water and then dried out at another station. And then we just cycle these vials. And when I go to a hot spring, I literally pipette hot spring water uh, onto slide wells or into vials like this. And I wait until they're dry and I can see the films of lipid. 
and in that films of, film of lipid, I'm, I'm baking, shaking and baking polymers. And then when we rehydrate, we get a population of protocells that are more stable because polymers tend to stabilize the compartment that they're in. It's like a self, it's a tautology in, in a way. You know, if you have a polymer, it's more stable because it's, it's contained in a vesicle. So therefore you get more polymers on the next round because the vesicles don't blow up. So all of this works. So for the scientific community, the struggle to wrestle with the ocean, wrestle with this thermodynamic uphill system, to wrestle with the inability to get to do actually realistic vent simulation that would produce anything, uh, it's just not productive. So in, in, in a sense, a paradigm shift can happen if a new model comes around which is suddenly super productive. And you can you can actually get to the protocell stage and get to the molecular evolution stage. And it's still, each of the steps is demonstrable not only in, uh, in the feedstocks, but in the actual landscape that we know of from the Paleoarchaean. We know, we know the atmospheric composition three and a half billion years ago. We know, we know what water was there. We know what infall material was there. We know that there were hot springs. We have evidence of it. We know the chemical composition of those hot springs because they did a drilling program in Northwest Australia where they found all the critical uh, elements needed proposed for an origin of life, including boron in the, in the pristine drill cores. So we have all of this and we have evidence that life was thriving on the land as far back as we can look. And it sort of points to uh, a location, say, at 4 billion years or 4.1 billion years, where the landscape isn't that different. Uh, atmospheric composition has changed a little bit. And there's still infall materials, but we're looking at a similar Earth separated by about five, 600 million years from our evidence of strong microbial communities. So it really, it's, it's, it's building up the weight of evidence that, that life needed subaerial landscapes to get going. So let's talk about the specifics of the experimental data that you're getting and the process of it, because this Genesis machine sounds very interesting to me. And I want to get a good sense of the chemical pathways that go from the very beginning through the preparatory work that you do to what you actually take to a hot spring and what you do at the hot spring and what you see. So we, we as scientists have to limit our parameters. So as much as we'd like to throw, say, amino acids and, and nucleotides in the same mix and do a complex mixture, that would produce something that would be very hard to analyze. So we're, we're in a sense, uh, limited by uh, the complexity of, of the chemistry of being able to actually observe things that emerge from it. So our group has been focused only on nucleotide, like oligonucleotide formation. So an oligonucleotide is basically just multiple nucleotides, which are the things that make up RNA and DNA in chains together. So you don't have them loose in solution. You have them chained together through these dehydration reactions. Yes. And so we, we've had to convince very skeptical colleagues that this wet-dry cycling worked. And the methods that we have used uh, included, of course, uh, gel electrophoresis, where we show ladders, we show uh, clumps of larger polymers. We have recently started to, we've done nanopore sequencing on these short oligonucleotides. And we've done uh, HPLC with the group at Stanford to show the spikes where the oligonucleotides are. And published also atomic force microscope images of the uh, strands and ring structures that we see that say weren't on the plate. We've, we've actually done the wet-dry cycling inside an AFM chamber. So before you, you, you can't see anything because it's individual bases. And then after you see this tangled mass of, of material that's self-assembled, and that includes DNA as well as RNA. So Dave's book of Oxford, Oxford book about four years ago is called Assembling Life, because what he is putting forward is that self-assembly, and you've had other guests talking about this in, 
on the podcast is a very, very powerful force. Self-assembly begets self-organization later. And then self-determination is when a system can make a decision, an energy-driven, information-driven decision that perpetuates it into the future. And that would be your in the protocell evolution epoch. Hey, when you're doing these AFM experiments, from everything that I understand of AFM, you have a, some kind of silica platform on which you're doing the experiment. And so do you, as if you change the platform on which you do the experiments, like the, the basis, does it change the results that you get for self-assembly? I think they usually use mica. Mica, that's what I was thinking of. Mica is usually used. Uh, some have proposed that mica has a slightly promoting influence on polymer formation, uh, but it wouldn't. We've also done the wet dry cycling, sent the samples. Uh, rather than doing the experiment, doing the polymerization on the mica, we've actually sent them samples from the hot spring in the lab, and they see the same things. So well, what's the, the surface that it would dry on inside the laboratory? Just glassware. Glassware. A slide. And we know that we're not getting biological material because, well, a couple of things. We use a, a millipore uh, filter if we're using hot spring water so we don't get a whole bacterium <laughs> just swimming around in the solution. But also there's organic material from the tridal material from the environment. So what we do is we use uh, a and U bases for RNA, so that when we see the RNA polymer, it's all A's and U's, and it's very it's synthetic. There would be never anything in biology that was all A's and U's, and oligo T for DNA. So it's all T's. Mm. So all of these years, these fifteen years of work, has been to to demonstrate to our colleagues again and again with multiple analysis, uh, multiple wet dry cycling modalities at different pHs. Uh, that this is possible in establishing what we're calling an herbal range or an herbal zone in which, oh, we need at 93 Celsius in New Zealand when I went to Rotorua in 2018, we were at 93 Celsius. We set the tray down in basically a fumarolic but also bubbling liquid environment. I hydrated and dehydrated that, that tray for four hours, like four cycles. And we, we got abundant RNA polymers, these synthetic RNA polymers, much more than we get in the laboratory, which was a surprising result. And it turns out there are probably uh, cations or other things in the hot spring water that promote the reaction that we didn't predict before. And all of this is done with membrane material that's present. So we've done that in Rotorua. We, we did it at Fly Geyser near where Burning Man is held. In fact, Fly Geyser is a very interesting uh, hot spring environment uh, created by accident by ranchers 100 years ago who are trying to look for a water supply for their cattle. And you can go there and it's just spraying out the top of the siliceous tower, multicolored tower. And we did our science there and we got products there too at 60 Celsius and more of a neutral pH. So to show to our colleagues that it works in the lab at various ranges, herbal ranges, uh, herbal, that there's an herbal zone for this type of reaction on the landscape in analogs that would have existed on the on the early earth. So it's a, it's a long and slow process, but we're finding now that multiple groups are have repeated our work and are just taking this approach now. And so when you set up the experiment, what are the pieces that you have to add to it in order to make it go? Like, what do you add versus what comes from the environment in order to produce a viable protocell? So what we add is a source for membranes, carboxylic acid, like C10, C12, C14, that are plausible and meteoritic material that have been demonstrated come, can be delivered by meteoritic material. We add non-activated uh, nucleotides, and that's one of the big difference differences because the basically the Gibbs free energy that's available through dehydration and water being a leaving group uh, creates the condensation reaction. So you don't have to have an activated um, base unit, and then we add water at a certain pH, and that that's all we're doing. 
So we get these long chains of RNA-like polymers or DNA-like polymers that get trapped into the into a membranous enclosure when we, we re-wet the system. We see budding and then encapsulates these polymers. And we think that some of the polymers are attached to membrane surfaces, which creates a stabilizing factor. So they're in a little wobbly, you know, fatty acid compartment, which is pretty wobbly and uh, leaky, but the polymer is not going to get out of it. It's just too big. So it sort of self-selects for the growth of larger polymers, but the attachment of the polymer to, to the membranous enclosure stabilizes it as well. And so over, say, three or four cycles, we see a growth in polymer population until we are sequestering, you know, more and more of the monomers. So that that's that's the general run of so we don't add anything else. We're not adding literally nothing else in terms of any kind of an enzyme or any any kind of activation. We don't need to do that. Mm. I mean, aside from the enzymes, obviously, it sounds really similar to PCR in a way. It, it, I was just thinking. That yeah, it, it. I mean, and that's obviously been something that people have heard a lot about. You know, with the whole COVID fiasco and everything. And so I wonder. I wonder if it was a Kerry Mullis who developed that in his garage, mm -hmm. cycling these temperatures. I, I wonder if he was thinking about any of these origins of life things when he he uh, he, he wasn't. Those. But uh, Jack Shostak, who's one of our colleagues at, at Harvard, he who won the Nobel Prize for the telomerase discovery, I think in two thousand nine or ten, described this as natural PCR. This very and and his group is looking at hot cold cycling. So, and they're doing protocell, excellent protocell work uh, at, at their group at Harvard. And so it's definitely, yeah, there are patterns there. And I can share something with you. Uh, our new postdoc who's been here for six months, who's just in Ecuador at the ISL meeting, he is working on the templating uh, challenge, which is can we introduce a short oligo, if you will, of, of, of DNA by introducing hot water, we separate the strand. We, we melt the strand so we get the exposed strand and then the monomers of RNA can template on it and we can get template-directed synthesis going. And then the wet-dry cycling allows the entire condensation reaction to happen. Mm. So if we can demonstrate this, and there's this preliminary work already has shown that this is possible, but we're going to run it through the nanopore sequencer. And if we see a large library of identical copies of RNA, we'll know that we've achieved template-directed synthesis without enzymes in a prebiotically plausible setting. So that will be a next step into the great chasm from self-assembled but not doing much on their own protocells, not free living in any way toward the autonomous protocell, more autonomous protocell system toward the fissioning living cell in our system, which is very complex. So it's that chasm we all look across now and say, where do we get catalysts into here? We're, if we have templating, uh, one of the discussions I had with Freeman Dyson for several years before his, his passing in 2019 was, how far can we get this system to go on phenotype alone? And he felt that well, just through through selection in the environment, we might get certain forms that give us structure, that give us phenotypic uh, evolution. And my argument was we need some kind of genotype early on, whether it be the most simple autocatalytic set in terms of Stuart Kaufman's thinking or a template-based way to store heritable traits and drive a catalytic reaction. We need something. To, to be the origin of information early on, or we just get stuck at the at the protocell aggregation phase where we get more of them, but they they don't they they'll cap out. They won't they won't continue to adapt and grow and be able to survive in different environments. So this kind of brings us to this really interesting and weird tendency of life versus just chemistry, right? Which is heritability and reproduction and memory and all of these things. But more than anything, I think it has something to do with desire and will, because I think that the difference between 
just a protomolecule versus the cell is that the cell can want something. It can have an environment and it can say, I want to go over here and do this thing. And obviously bacteria do that in a, in a terribly rudimentary way, not in anything like what we have. But I have the suspicion that what we have does not arise somewhere on the long road between the first cell and us. It is already present in the most mm -hmm. basic form in the first cell. But I wouldn't go so far as to say that it is present in the first proto-cell, except in some way that is defined just by, by equilibrium conditions, right? Where there's, there's a moment where a cell can move away from equilibrium by taking its own internal equilibrium with it. And I think that that's the genesis of, of life. And so I wonder what your thoughts are about that moment and how it arises. And if you think about it in a similar way, or if you think about it in a different way. So here, here let's return to our geologist and biologist on the crunchy ADN landscape. So when she takes the, uh, the black sludge, the ignoble sludge, if you will, maybe it will win the Nobel Prize. Uh, and she places it into another pool that might have some just membranous material, but stuff that's just self-assembling, but not in term it can't, can't be self-preserving. And that pool may have a lower uh, concentration of available solutes, organic solutes to work with, but still, so she stands there for, it comes back in, in, in a week, and that pool has successfully been colonized by the black sludge. Now, none of this is living. It's a chemical system. And what she could do then is sequence that and find that another short polymer has emerged that is able to adapt to the lower solute concentration of that particular pool. So there you have what I think uh, you could call an ignition point. That changing environment uh, conditions that would, would a system with completely passive self-assembly would just get destroyed, but this system with a little bit of agency, uh, energy-driven, and it has some chemical switches that can decide one way or the other, and it has the ability to template some information to generate new products. So the front edge of that sludge probably started dying right away because it didn't have enough concentrated foodstuffs effectively. But the back edge was undergoing selection pressures and out of combinatorial selection and evolution, that template arose that was the magic bullet that allowed a low solute system to be viable for it. So that Wait. ignition, and, and all of this is potentially straw manned with uh, synthetic biology approaches to actually try such systems to, to jumpstart the queue of combinatorial evolution and attempt to make a system that can do these things. So, but in that moment where we go from just some nucleotide assemblies to pigment, what is the, even, even there, what is, what is the line between those two things? Because I feel like the, for me, I think of pigment and I think of complex biosynthetic pathways. But it seems like in the protocell model, the pigment can arise from a very, very rudimentary environment. So what, what we're working with is uh, a proposal called the, it's really called the hypothesis of continuity. And that this is Hans Morowitz's term. So he, he studied a lot of the energetics of living systems. He's a brilliant researcher, was a colleague of Dave's. So what his, his, Thesis is that nature never wholesale replaces things. It always just builds on previous things. So if you take Morowitz's principle of continuity all the way back, what that argues for, and this is the fundamental sort of the breaking of the atom, smashing the atom of biology, that every function that emerges in the living world later existed as a natural uh, in, uh, compound or process in the environment that was just there for free. And what the pigment is, is potentially quinones or 
polycyclic compounds from uh, meteorites have been demonstrated to give you a, a couple of pH gradients across the membrane. So if you hit them with, you hit them with UV, you get a pH gradient. So you have an energy source that's this instant with, with these, especially with the quinones. And there are a number of publications on this. So what you're getting from free in the environment is not only the, the building blocks and the membranous enclosures, you're actually getting pigments. So the proto-pigment, which is this for free in the environment. So when the, the biologist scooped up the silvery stuff, it was just self-assembling. There wasn't any kind of energy capture other than the wet-dry cycling energy system and the heat in the pool and redox sources in the pool. So those were three energy sources. When she came back, a, a pigment that was naturally environment had gotten coupled to, say, a glycolysis cycle just because the pigment could deliver basically a, an electron path that could deliver energy to a cycle. So it got coupled in. And then through, uh, you know, the million years that had gone past, the pigment got replaced by a, a, a substitute pigment that the protocell could make. And so the, the blackness spread. So instead of it being a, a tan color, because if you look at, if you look at this material in a, in a vial, it creates some of these polycyclics create this kind of a milky uh, brown substance. So if you're all the way to black, that means you've, you've manufactured more than, than would be typical from a meteoritic delivery. So that system that was working not so well, but just well enough in the natural environment has already got replaced by protobiology. And, and this scaffolding is building upon earlier properties that, that were extant in the environment in the principle of continuity. And I mean, these, so let's talk about the necessity for gradients and energy exchange in the emergence of life, because you mentioned the quinones, and the quinones are either electron donors or electron acceptors. You say that they couple to the glycolytic cycle, and that's the breakdown of sugars. And so what is the, what is the, what is the arc that you see here developing? where there is energy exchange, which can then later be used to drive free choice behavior. You know, I, I came across this guy who, who wrote a little bit in the 80s and 90s um, named Rod Swenson, who had this idea that the problem with understanding this emergence of life was that people weren't considering life as part of a bigger system and that what was doing all the work was the environment essentially and that all this entropy that you know needs to happen for a system to move forward was external to the organisms and if you just stare at the organisms you're going to miss the bigger picture and so so what we can do because we actually have a physical a completely physical model that we can actually now produce in the laboratory and study that we consider to be prebiotically plausible we can now start drilling down. And the next work we're doing is something we call the progenitor. So the question is, and this is also goes into a deeply philosophical uh, question, I think it ties into some of your previous guests' comment, is what is the medium in which life can emerge? And I, I'd like to start with a, a metaphor for you. Uh, you, you know about uh, Fred Hoyle's proposal that uh, life is, is implausible because uh, if a, a hurricane or a tornado went through a junkyard, it wouldn't assemble a 747. Remember mm -hmm. that uh, Hoyle's tornado, it's called. Well, let's take, take that up. What is the junkyard and what are you trying to assemble? So consider if you had a crazy wild-haired inventor. If you go to an inventor's workshop, you know, an inventor with a mind, even maybe a fuzzy mind, they have drawers and drawers and drawers of parts. So they have a lot of parts to choose from. Say it's a Dyson in his vacuum cleaner testing in the 70s, made hundreds of different models. So he had tens of thousands of parts, many of which didn't get used. And yet a, a beautiful vacuum design came out of it through trial and error. So he was literally assembling like an impeller with a such and such and trying to make a bagless vacuum cleaner. 
which we, you know, many of us use today. Uh, so if you took the inventor out of the picture, we don't need the creator, we don't need the intelligence, and you simply have a process that goes through the workshop and picks and plucks parts, puts a simple machine together, and that machine goes on an assembly line together with other machines that have are, are assembled from those parts, and it goes through a simple test. And if the machine passes the test, it comes back around, is, is maybe disassembled or added to, or a simple, uh, the mechanism that assembled the machine is re replicated and new machines are put through more tests and more tests. And you could actually do uh, the design of a new innovation without a person there. So the progenitor proposal suggests that you need a, an environment much more complex than the living cells that will emerge from it to support the process. And this is sort of a different approach than Origin of Life has worked with before, which was, well, we have, a, we have laboratory water and we have a few components and we make a protocell and we try to do things with it. Well, that system is going to run down to equilibrium because there's not enough stuff there. There isn't enough selection. There aren't enough there aren't enough uh, little proto experiments to work. Now we're in the in the populations of trillions of protocell cycling, and their parts are random sequence polymers. Is that enough, or is that system just going to go to mush, or just simply never never take a jump in in terms of molecular evolution? So what we're suggesting now is based on work of colleagues at University of Washington, Roy Black and and his group. Cornell et al., et cetera, where they propose that, and others are proposing this, if you zoom down into membranous media, you will notice there's two modalities, things that are stuck to membranes and the things that are enclosed within membranes. Stuff that is enclosed within membranes is in a more dilute, disorganized volume. Cells are exquisitely organized to concentrate things in their interior volumes. Cells do not have a lot of garbage and random stuff. Cells are exquisitely maintained to optimize the likelihood of reactions happening. So if you don't have that, what can you work with? Zoom down into the membrane and see all the things that are attached to the membrane. Pores, rafts, uh, transmembrane interlocutors that will be there they are effectively concentrated in a two-dimensional medium and they're moving around like crazy because membranes are create this transport mechanism. So what we're proposing is that the progenitor to life itself is the processes that are plausible to allow encounters between polymers and products and for reactions to happen is all affixed to highways of membrane. And that these highways of membranes form layers in a drying phase because they, they go to a lamellar structure when you dry down the protocells, they fuse like little sausages, they start becoming layers, and then they bud off spherical compartments. If everything is affixed to the membrane boundary, it has the advantage of stability, stuff stays, stays around longer. Uh, the probability, the likelihood of, of getting together with other polymers, the ability to form sets of polymers that are these superstructures or see these origamis, and transmembrane electron uh, electron transport channels, which have been demonstrated to work with these quinones. So if you're on the membrane, you have access to energy sources, energy drivers, and uh, complexes of interaction. So the inventor's workshop for the origin of life, the progenitor medium, is a membranous uh, mass undergoing phase transitions. And the highways, uh, it's immense. So when, when you're drying down, you get sheets. You ultimately go to a sheet format where you can imagine the combinatorial or you know, like Conway's game of life, emergent phenomena in these polymer affixed sheets in constant motion. It's potentially a combinatorial engine in the search for catalytic cycles or rare combinations of things. So this is the, the current work we just 
delivered a book chapter which which introduces the term and we're working on a full uh, multi-article series uh, for a journal to propose that this is the medium if we can make the progenitor medium the sludge if you will and have it richly endowed more richly endowed than just protocells with random polymers in them we can observe things emerging from it through chemical evolution what drives them to increasingly become more complex and to develop memory though is it something that is inherent to life itself that's the question of the age uh it's a very very good one it it may be that it can't help but do that because if if you if you're a population of things that is either there in the next minute or not there in the next minute because of a degrading selective force some members of your population will just have the right stuff to be there in the next minute and if they can amplify and make copies of whatever they are they're going to take over the population and this has been demonstrated in um, molecular evolution at scripps institute at harvard a number of groups do this with bare i call them bare naked oligonucleotides you can you can observe full on uh, emergence of say a ribozyme with ligation capacity you can evolve that in a column with beads you can do those experiments so is a they're a very healthy field in in doing that what we're proposing is let's do it in encapsulated systems and perhaps even with uh, membrane attached systems as as the carrying as the, the the substrate effectively i think this is kind of what swenson was getting at too is that you have an environment let's say the the any static environment has a tendency to degrade and if the life is capable of accelerating that degradation then it's all of a sudden the system is a forward reaction yeah and you have to dave is much better at explaining this than i am because he's the membrane biophysicist i'm a computer science type big thinker sort of a guy but what you're doing and, and this is wonderful work uh i think it's, it's hoffman at indiana who wrote nature's ratchet the book nature's ratchet mm -hmm. about how enzymes are these machines that get slammed by water molecules until they they get something that fills a pocket say for instance something that makes a polysaccharide so it gets a sugar molecule in one pocket, it's getting slammed around, it changes shape, it gets a sugar molecule in the next po pocket, it's getting slammed around, so it's taking all this free energy, and then it cl closes and, and pinches those two saccharides together and makes a polysaccharide. And then there's a reset butter button, so you don't violate uh, laws of thermodynamics, and the reset button gets hit, and it releases the, the disaccharide, and there you have it, and heat is produced. So it's that that setting, it's it's the sole environment that life can operate at that scale. So this is sort of the tools we have to work with. So now the existential question of agency or going from self-preservation, which is stabilizing factors in protocells, to self-determination, where an energy-driven, information templated, able to mutate switching system is able to produce an adaptation out of the selection from random sequences or previous sequences that need to be mutated such systems can be made in the lab with synthetic biology and can be observed at work you know so we don't have to wait for the unlikely event happening in in our warm little ponds it's completely plausible so the emergence of a information based decision-making switch in protobiology that has an outcome that pushes that set of populations forward, of polymers forward into a new generation is completely plausible. And, and pieces of that have been demonstrated. So what we're proposing is pull it all together into a sludgy medium that is a pro proposed progenitor or effectively a womb for life that has enough random parts floating around, that has enough tornadoes going through, it has a conveyor belt to test all the little machines that are made, and it goes through three distinct cycles of 
layered encounters, uh, vesicular stabilizing uh, lifetime in the aqueous solution, and then the merging gel phase thing where all kinds of metabolic and catalytic things happen. And as a pool is drying down, all kinds of stuff gets forced through into the membrane system. So the system is very, very capable of supporting uh, evolution selection on a vast scale. I mean, we're talking quadrillions of encounters per second. It's a machine for, for doing chemical search. And does the machine have its own agency or is it simply an outcome of what the universe made that in these conditions, it is a rockingly powerful engine. And in fact, that little handful of sludge which arguably has more moving parts and distinct objects than the entire planet it rests upon. Because the geology is not too complex, but that sludge outnumbers the countable parts to the planet. That's one, one kind of a hand-waving thing. So what you see before life is this giant jump in, in complexity in a system that can then lead to the first, what we might call a simple, protocellular communities, but that system itself is a nonlinear massive jump in complexity that's simply self-assembled under the right conditions in the universe. I mean, but the idea of simply self-assembling complexity to me seems difficult to work with because complexity isn't something that appears without life being around. All of this is foundationally based on chemistry. And when we talked to James Tour, Tour's entire thing was the chemistry doesn't work out. And he was always banging on the drum of chirality. And this is something that is weird in life because all of life uses D-amino acids, but L-amino acids can also be synthesized. And the mirror worlds did not develop, but only one path did. And when you do random synthesis inside of these kinds of conditions, what do you see in terms of chirality? How pure are the molecules that you're getting? Well, we're, we're not really doing these sort of racemic mixtures. Uh, other colleagues are working on uh, the meteoritic sources, uh, the actual organo processes that produce the DRL amino acids actually favor one or the other. Mm. So you get a more of an abundance of one at the source. And that that's a, a bunch of work is going on there. Then there's work uh, going on in the sort of self-assembly field where uh, this is sort of weird stuff. You get what uh, Dave calls pre-polymerization. So if you reduce entropy and in a layered system and water is leaving, uh, what we think we're seeing, and this is through uh, nuclear imaging, is that the bases are pre-polymerizing, they're pre-aligning themselves geometrically. Between as the water the, leaves. As the water leaves, so that when we, this is why we are getting double-stranded products. So pre-polymerization meaning that literally the geometric stacking is occurring before the condensation reaction. So it, it's, it's one of the explanations why we have such high productivity in wet-dry cycling to create these immense complex structures so quickly like within one cycle. So, yeah, it's, it's that, really fact, so that factors into the L&D you know, uh, questions as well. If that's the medium that we're working in, and of course, if the first templates are LRD, then they're going to only work with LRD. And it, this chirality question may not be re that relevant at all. Well, I just imagine that, oh, so if I can imagine an origin of life situation where there is a mixture of L-amino acids, of D-amino acids that are being reproduced off of rudimentary nucleotide templates. Right, So you have a small nucleotide template, it's inside of a protocell, you've gotten to the point where there's kind of this collection of stuff that is present and persistent, and the system is more or less, it's got all the pieces in place, right? It's got the protocell, inside the protocell there's some kind of rudimentary 
chemical reaction that powers metabolism so things can actually move inside of the protocell. You have the quinones on the outside that are transducing the, let's say, solar radiation into a chemical energy that can be coupled to something that's happening inside the cell across the membrane. So you have these two pools. Once you have two pools of things, or not pools, two environments, because we're inside of one pool. So if you have two environments, then all of a sudden you have a gradient. The gradient allows you to turn the water wheel of the cell. Okay. Mm -hmm. The water wheel of the cell makes L and D amino acids. Why wouldn't we have two paths of evolution that you have both types of life on Earth? So initially, the amino acids are all going to be exogenously sourced, the, the famous free lunch. So if, if because of the predilection of the source being L, then the whole system is going to evolve toward making L. So if there's an, even like a 55 percent uh, predominance of L, it might be just enough to tip the system over into favoring L only. So that that might be a, a hand waving uh, explanation. Is there a? I, I'm just going to throw a curveball out here. So, panspermia. Is there a chance that we are thinking life? has to have been formed under the conditions of Earth's early years when in fact it arrived from a completely foreign environment and we're sort of looking under the wrong rock, so to speak? Well, one, that's a, a vaguely testable hypothesis in that if we do find microbial life in the rocks in Mars and we're able to get them back to the lab and sequence them, and if we find that they're very close cousins, then the argument would be Life started on Mars first and was transported to Earth in crustal material in fall. And that, that's, but it could have been the other way around as well. So that, that will be, or if they're completely different. They're, so that, that's the one place we could get some evidence. What I would suggest, though, is in the, uh, in the world of urability, it would seem as though life patterns exquisitely on its home environment. So today you can see the, the shade, the, the shadow of the original origin source because of the principle of continuity, it's gonna have similar properties. So uh, Mars having a much higher iron concentration means that it's harder for membranes to form. So this was the work of Francesca Carey in our group before her master's thesis. So she did laboratory work on Mars simulant water and found that membrane formation and protocell formation was quite challenged by the different chemical regime, the iron regime of Mars. But does that mean that Mars is inurable? But it might be that, that Mars life is uh, it, it adapted to that. So if it was transported to the Earth to an environment that, that was different, would it be simply extinguished? See, I was thinking of things much farther away than Mars, actually, because, you know, there's been some pretty incredible research around bacterial spores. Like, I know NASA took some of these up and exposed them to space and then re-germinated them. And, you know, the interior of some of these meteorites that fall are, are quite cool, actually. And so there's this idea that, you know, there, there are some preliminary studies, too, that they've been able to germinate these spores after millions and millions of years. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine something coming from a really, really far off world that looks, you know, sort of like Earth, but not quite like Earth, and, and maybe had some conditions that we can't even imagine. And, and that we can test this by finding extraterrestrial sort of crustal material coming through or within our solar system, and then we would have to bioassay it, see if any such spores were there. It's yeah, tough. Yeah, well, it, even, I mean, we didn't even realize there was extra extra solar system material coming in until very recently. I know that's Avi Loeb's whole... Mm -hmm. tick mm -hmm. right and uh and it's going to be really interesting what that looks like if it can be identified how old it is these questions of of contamination from other solar systems it's something we hadn't really seriously considered until the last few years what what i might suggest is another approach which is uh two things one is the sterilizing potential of environments so for example Many colleagues are now suggesting that perhaps uh, Enceladus, or these, these icy moons, uh, 
certainly they're habitable, especially if there are hydrothermal energy sources that are driving the geysers. Maybe if that's just tidal forces and cracking and pressure, perhaps less so. But that because there is liquid water present, it's arguable that there, there could be forms of extremophile, that we call extremophile life there. But for an origin to occur, if an origin is less promising now for those worlds, then the question is, how do we distribute, how do we get life there? Now, if you have a, a piece of crustal earth material land on the, the icy surface of Enceladus, it's a, it's a vacuum, there's no atmosphere, it's highly irradiated. Those microbes have to somehow get through 10 kilometers of ice. And then they have to be fortuitously deposited in a place where there are energy sources, chemical energy sources that are appropriate, that are pre-adapted pre -adapted to, to then start to thrive or even have one generation once they come out into solution. It's a long and, and, and challenging path, similar with Mars or Venus. If an Earth meteorite falls on the surface of Mars, it'll become sterilized pretty fast. And the whole surface of Mars is covered with uh, perchlorates. It's an also vacuum environment. Uh, it's very sterilizing. Venus, of course, we know it would you know, have a heat death at you know, hundreds of degrees at the surface. So it perhaps... Uh, it's less easy than we might suppose for uh, a viable environment to be present to receive such a cargo. Even on the early Earth, it might be argued that uh, Earth wasn't... Re if you have mm -hmm. photosynthetic bacteria, you have something that's fairly evolved, like a eukaryote landing on the Earth 4.1 billion years ago, it has a high likelihood of becoming uh, completely destroyed by the environment. Also, if there's life there, um, if we took our protocells, our simple protocells, and we placed them in a dish, uh, just put them out on the porch, all kinds of microbes would, you know, and we put, they would be a food source. So those flimsy protocells would just get consumed. This is why it's quite possibly that there's no second, there's no second start to life because life, uh, Earth today is inurable. It can't start life again from because the, the chemical processes are so fragile and so inefficient. The compartments that are made are tasty morsels for things that know what to do with them. And so unless you're in, a, in an isolated chamber, you can't do this type of chemistry. It just gets eaten. So yeah, that's, that's what's so cool about bacterial spores, though, is they, they seem to be able to taste the environment and wake up when things are, are appropriate for them to do so mm -hmm. and you know you can eat a bacterial spore and it's going to be fine it'll, it'll just come out the other side for the most part it'll probably hatch inside of you not always not some not some proportion of them i, I, I mean the, the point uh, the point that you're making here is i think a viable one which is that you could have a planet that has spores on it that are able to grow in the conditions of the early earth that because Bruce, I think that what you're saying is is also really important, which is that whatever arrives has to be able to survive in the conditions of that planet. And so it must have been formed in conditions that were commensurate with where it arrives. And so all of a sudden you're narrowing your probabilistic space. And so mm -hmm. I see this as something that's possible, but you'd have to I think that it's also possible that it arises here from what's happening on the surface and from what's falling onto it. And like everybody always says, if it does arrive from somewhere else, it had to have started there. You're just pushing the... Yeah, the only curiosity is just if it, if it, did, if it happens in a very different environment than the one that we're imagining because we're constraining our probability space to the Earth itself. What happened? Yeah, but then like that because th this is already a theoretical discipline, right? Like we're already stuck with the fact that we're working with things that are very, very difficult to evaluate because even our models of what the early Earth was like are changing. And so you have all these things that are moving pieces. If you add to it the unknown possibility space of what if it formed somewhere else that we can't see, hear, or feel, I just, I feel like that just turns it into uh, this. At, at our ISL meetings, if if someone was accepted to present panspermia, uh, which was uh, would be unlikely because it's not really a scientific uh, proposal. 
because it can't be worked on, it can't be tested. Um, I guess you could the, test it by like going and surveying stuff that's floating around the solar system and searching for extraterrestrial objects you, and looking you, to see and, if they've and got that, biologicals. And in that them. could be so for now, it's conjecture, it's not even a hypothesis or it's a notion, perhaps. So I mean, we would, they, why, do, why do you say that it's not a hypothesis? Because no specific uh, tests have been proposed that are are plausible, we, plausibly within reach of science to do. So it's it's conjecture. No you specific go, test would be to to assay the crustal material in the solar system. Yeah, uh, but it's still I think it's with the with the workers in the field they they would express their frustration at the meeting and ask for something more specific and more grounded. Because in, in fact, because of the rock record, I'll, I'll show you another rock here. Because of the rock record, this is a, a beautifully formed, uh, what is called a lacustrine or lake shore stromatolite. Mm -hmm. So these layers here are basically, this is what you might call a mudstone, similar to what's being found uh, by the Mars rovers. So you've got clay on this side, and you have a lot of iron infused, and those layers there are laid down by microbial communities. This is 2.7 billion years old. It's from part of Australia called the what's Northwest Australia, the Tumbiana Formation. We know that that lake shore was the lake was about the size of Lake Malawi. We know the atmosphere content at the time. We know the water content. I have another stromatolite with desiccation cracks in it, or another uh, sample. Uh, in, in another locality, they found raindrop preservation in these rocks. They found stream bed ripples. So single day events can be preserved in these extremely rare Archean landscapes back to three and a half billion years ago. So we have a really good model for what our planet looked like a few percent after the time that's proposed for life's beginning. And we can recreate that model in the lab uh, with all the starting points with the, in fact, McMaster University has the planet simulator device uh, where they can subject mineral surfaces to wet dry cycling and UV radiation and do analysis within, it's, it looks like a big pizza, like a complicated uh, R2D2 pizza oven. Hmm. And so the, we we have cert, we have some certainty around this, and we have certainty about materials available. There's some big gaps, of course. We have more certainty around the chemistry of polymerization and what is plausible without enzymes now. Uh, and we know that combinatorial selection works on the, that population of polymers. So you add this all up; it's way less guesswork, and we know. We know with some certainty that if we went back three and a half billion years ago to that same hot spring represented by, by this sample here, we could do our polymer chemistry in that hot spring to today if we could get back there. And that that hot spring would have been flowing four billion years ago or 4.1 billion. They would have been present. So it, it's converging lines of evidence that are really adding up to a story. And I think it's, it's, we're perhaps where physics was in like 1860, 1870 after Maxwell. There's perhaps some great thing that's coming like relativity theory or quantum mechanics, but the the Maxwell sort of classical world uh, and being able to get electrons to flow down wires and to use some of, of the techniques on a daily basis, we're kind of there. And there's obviously going to be breakthroughs in the 21st century, but I, th I think we we're past the point in the field, at least in the professionals of, of these conjectures, these notional conjectures, we'll entertain them, but we actually need, we have a lot of work to do. We actually have, have some results to, to get done. So we're kind of, things like panspermia are, are just not listened to anymore. Maybe they, and frankly, hydrothermal vent proposals are less listened to now because it's seen as conjecture and there are no laboratory results to back it up. So Karl Popper, again. And so Nick Lane is working pretty hard on these hydrothermal vent environments, and you think that his results just aren't living up to the hype? Or he he is perhaps 
you know, I don't want to insult other colleagues, but I think he's the finest scientist that's currently working on this with the most resources. And I visited his group in 2019 to, to compare some notes. And one of the things we actually were writing our full hypothesis and we send it, we critique his approach and we send him the hypothesis to review before we submitted it. Uh, but during the, the, the presentation to his graduate students, you know, I'd passed this around and I'd shown the closed cycle, how we can get combinatorial processes going. Uh, the students are really interested. And Nick, one of the things that Nick Lane said during the seminar was, I don't think we can get to polymers in our system, in the hydrothermal mm. vent system. And then the student asked, um, you know, Professor Lane, why, is, why are polymers important in the origin of life? And at that point, I realized, ah, okay, we, are, we have a room full of geochemists here. Don't really study living systems. If, if they're asking the question of why do we need polymers for life, they're not working on the life question. And it sort of refactored my entire thinking. And then talking with Mike Russell later at conferences, uh, Albert Branscombe, and even Laurie Barge at JPL, I realized they, so if you want to steal man or steal woman, their approach, they're looking at, uh, this is what Albert says, we don't, and, and what also Nick said, uh, he said, I don't buy the exogenous delivery argument. I don't think you would get enough materials concentrated and in enough purity for things to happen. He, he, he doesn't buy those. And Branscombe's uh, approach with Mike Russell was, we need to have almost like a Merck catalog running in an environment that's spitting out just the right stuff in, in high states of purity, not stony material and all this sort of stuff, in order to get a bioreactor to go to get the energy gradients to work, and et cetera, et cetera. They have that entire perspective. And once you understand that, you, you see the flaws, but also the, the potency of some of their arguments. So that's why I went back to some of the meteoritic infall people and said, what about all the material, that, the sort of dirty, yucky material that comes out? And some, some of them had done work with real carbonaceous chondrites where they actually drop, you know, like the Murchison, drop it into solution and it separates out and you actually get pure, fairly pure feedstocks out of that. You get a lot of stony material. It's only five or 6% organic. You get stony material that falls to the bottom but you get the membrane separating and you get a lot of the organic separating. But I said, well, maybe they still have a point. Is this a, is this, it's not a stream, right? It's not a continuous stream. So then the work with Ben Pierce and others on the biogenic atmosphere is a gap filler in, in addressing their concerns, which is if you have atmospheric synthesis, you have pure feedstocks coming down without the irregularity of what asteroid came in, where and when, interplanetary dust particles being another source. If the atmosphere itself becomes biogenic, just like Titans, then you have an abundance of more pure feedstocks available for a, a critical period of time. So they bring up reasonably good points, but they're never looking at combinatorial selection. If you look at uh, a hydrothermal vent article, they never mention polymers. They never mention selection. They never mention evolution. So they're two, three steps down just trying to get organics to appear, large, large organics. And then there's notions about evolution being possible. But if Nick doesn't believe polymers are possible in their system because of thermodynamics, they can't get to any kind of plausible form of selection and evolution. So they're doing really interesting geochemistry in vents, but it is not a vector toward the origin of life. The other hand, what does their geochemistry tell us about hot springs on land? So I was going out to Fly Geyser, and Mike Russell and I are in pretty regular communications, and he's the father of high, alkaline hydrothermal vent uh, approach. And I sent him pictures, and he said, oh, here's me in a cowboy hat at Fly Geyser like 20 years ago. That's really cool, Mike. Can I send you our results? So I sent him all of our 
polymerization results and some of the rock sample, like pictures of the chambers, the little compartments in, I broke off pieces of the geyser to study what the flow reactor was doing. And I said, Mike, we need your help as a chimney, uh, deeply chimney uh, understanding geochemist. We need more, we need more insight into the total environment because we're treating it like a chemistry lab, like a, a dish. Whereas you know what's going on inside those those chambers inside that vent, the, the, the mouth of the chimney, the throat of the chimney, what can happen at the surficial environment? So this is where my attempt is to uh, bring all the great science that those colleagues did that maybe won't lead to life in that environment, but it will deeply inform a subaerial vent uh, approach. And that's that's a work in progress. Because, as you know, there have been these divisions over the years. But Lori Barge and I, when we get together, we talk about what if we could abstract the, an origin of life away from any particular geochemical setting or environment and say, what in general do you need? And we kind of came up with some agreements. Like, we need a population subject to selection that can, can develop Catalyst and can develop information storage, just in general. Forget the chemistry. And so it's almost like, can we develop an abstract statement for how life can start anywhere? And, and that's a sort of another direction in, in the field is, what is the nature of life itself? Does it need network interconnects? Does it always need a membrane? Uh, does, it, does it always need a linear structure to store its information or can information be stored elsewhere and then you then you apply it back to chemistry that is plausible in our universe where do viruses fit into all of this for you now that's fascinating because uh, there have been many proposals that viruses are sort of a proto-life and that viruses could have been a transport mechanism for the first sort of genetic material what happened was when we started running our samples through the atomic force microscope at Tue Hassenkamp's group in the University of, of Copenhagen, he started not only seeing these tangled uh, sort of like up to like, several thousand more uh, tangled synthetic RNA, he started seeing rings. So there were like 300 mer rings. And that was in our first, first publication. He actually focused more on the rings because there are distinct structures that you can kind of study with AFM. And then uh, somebody who works on viroids, the, the viroid people started citing this paper because here it is like self-assembly of a viroid-like structure in, at the origin of life. So it's case building for, we can look beyond protocellular vesicular compartments. We can look at other things that do life-like things and that it may be a, have been a, an immensely important driver of early evolution in the progenian. Because if we're arguing that protocells are not the unit of selection often, it's, it's a clump of polymers in relationship, maybe affixed to a membrane or maybe free-floating like a viroid, then that's the unit of selection. The protocell is only a temporal thing that is, contains some of those widgets that so, subjects them to other forms of selection before it reintroduces them back to a common matrix. So in fact, the unit of selection is below the level of a protocell for quite some time. And we know that, that those units of selection are still in the microbial world, in the living world in general, that selection's operating at all, at all levels, in fact. But it has to start somewhere, and maybe it starts with something like a viroid. And so how does that fit into the what is the nature of life question? Because if the viroid needs the organism in order to propagate. And so that's, I think, why it's almost always been as being not necessarily life, because it's this kind of, it seems like a program that's maybe run by life that runs off on the sides, whereas the nature of life seems to be about independent purpose. Yeah, we've been talking about life for a long time. I'm curious if you have a definition for life, or if, it's, uh, if you just go with the, the list of qualities kind of thing. You know, Steve Benner, of course, helped 
uh, one of our, our more brilliant colleagues helped come up with that definition for NASA at a workshop, I think, 20, 25 years ago. Any, you know, any, any system cap capable of undergoing Darwinian uh, evolution through Darwinian selection. So that was what they came up with. Uh, if we look at the progenitor, and the progenitor is a hypothesized, it's testable. It, it's definitely, you could, you could make them on your stovetop uh, in, in a morning. You could read, you, you can do that. How to study them is a whole other question because these are, you know, my very small systems. That say, say, say there's a structure in there that's like a viroid that needs external sustenance to do its work. Can it do it within the progenitor medium? If it can do it within the progenitor medium, because the progenitor medium has energy, it has uh, a lot of flow states, a lot of encounters, it has a lot of material being potentially produced by catalytic cycles. So why not? It's just a simpler form of virus that's using the sludge to, to live an a, a independent life. It's just another polymeric complex doing its job, but that becomes the root of viruses. Isn't like defining life by Darwinian evolution a little bit circular? Because Darwinian evolution starts with life being a necessary component of the system. But you can have a pre Darwinian selection. So if you just define uh, Darwinian evolution as applied to a species, a species of bacteria or, or us, then those don't exist yet in the progenian. But Selection is still operating on the system. And this is one of the things that I love about Lee Cronin's work with Sarah Walker. They talk about selection being primal, going all the way back. Selection is operating in the universe. I just, I just love that, that argument because you really can see it everywhere. Selection as, apl as applied with informational templating becomes really supercharged. So selection of the formation of stars uh, it's the star is forming in a star nursery that has a cloud of material formed by explosions of previous stars. There's some kind of selection happening there because that there are more heavy elements, but it's very, very slow. There's no blueprint saying, make another star based upon this template. But as soon as you get template directed synthesis and cycles that are reading information, reading instructional information, the selection that is naturally in the environment gets supercharged on in large populations. And then you have this takeoff point long before you would call it Darwinian selection. That's why we call it combinatorial selection. And that's what the field of molecular evolution is doing all the time. No genes there either, just bare naked polymers moving down a column. Do those uh, bare naked polymers exhibit some proto form of consciousness then? I mean, is this because consciousness seems to be inextricably linked with this emergence of the life form, as far as I can see it. I mean, you can I can look at a bacteria and see that it's trying to do things. Well, uh, I just wrote, and I, I think I sent you the, the notes uh, that I wrote for a, a colleague who's doing a, a book on consciousness, asking the question, uh, if consciousness started in the warm little pond, you know, is this is where... Should we start all the way back in the warm little pond when a protocell community pushes back against its own demise through selection? A widget has been discovered and it's that widget's getting used, and it's getting used just because it's getting used, because of an amplifier, it's just happening. And but it 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 can navigate a system that would otherwise take it out of existence. Now, is that where we should start? Should we start where a, a, a protocell membrane or a sheet lamellar membrane has an active pore in it that decides whether to let something in or out? That, that, that could emerge early on with like a 90 mer. A 90 mer peptide could do that kind of decision making. Um, and that's the first sensing system that decides inside and outside. Now, if cells are are things that create models of the external world inside their own geochemistry or, or biochemistry. Is it the model that's being formed in the protocell on the way to the living cell 
it has to start to model its external environment. Is that a kind of consciousness? So what I'm trying to do with this particular author, because he's he's he's, he's such a, a good writer, to say, can we, he was interested in this, can we, and, and, and also to your point, Anastasia, can we learn something by taking life down to its start point that teaches us about life in general and then about our experience if we wind it back up through four point something billion years of evolution? And I think we can, and I think it's it's in the beginning phases. So the people that are sort of showing up are this author in particular, uh, Whiteheadian philosophers. Uh, people working on Terre de Chardin's noosphere idea uh, pulled us into a, a masterclass this summer because how is the noosphere, his idea of a, of a technosphere that humans have made around through the biosphere that creates a knowledge, a mental knowledge meme sphere, if you will, if you take it all the way back down, it's the geosphere, hydrosphere, uh, down to life's origins. Can we do, can we take patterns out of that sludge? We, can that sludge teach us more fundamental things than we'll ever learn by than by looking at really complex systems like a like a bacterium? It's already too complex to kind of rock it, but something that's like a protobacterium in community, where we can actually study ins and outs specifically and see small steps. And this is what Merlin Sheldrake and I've been talking about it. His father has this concept of uh, morphic resonance. So in a conversation with his with uh, Rupert, uh, I said, well, we can make these 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 objects and they can be subject to stresses that will create evolution, but that that evolution can be studied down to a pinpoint basis with nanopore sequencing. And his son, Merlin, who wrote the book Entangled Life, I don't know if you've read it about fungi, the beautiful book. He calls them the blobs. And he said, well, what if we had two adjacent dishes with two blobs subject to cycling? And would the discovery of some kind of powerful templating catalytic system in this one be more likely to occur through some kind of field-based morphic transfer into the second blob than a blob in a, in a, in a room far away? You know, so that, that's what Rupert's always been trying to find is a, a laboratory test for his morphic resonance idea that things that happen one place non-locally make things more likely to happen in other places. And there's there's some kind of a interconnect we haven't seen yet. So that's where it jumps into more metaphysics. Well, I think that the the changing of the environment is so key in all of this because there was you you mentioned that uh you and Lori Barge were talking about where life could evolve through the lens of specific universal principles. These are the things that we need no matter where we are. But I think that the environment can't be removed from the equation because the environment is what holds all of these things in place in order to allow the physics and the chemistry to actually occur. And so if you have some kind of system that starts to change the environment, then obviously the system that is not there yet is going to sense that, respond to it, and then react to it. It seems impossible that it would go any other way. So the, here, here's another interesting piece to this puzzle. There's a group uh, internationally called the Extended Evolutionary Synthesis you guys should definitely interview people from this group. And <clears throat> their proposal is there are things like epigenetics, uh, niche construction theory, uh, and group group selection theory that are trans they're they're hy hyper uh, genetic in that information is transferred across generations, uh, not strictly through the the tunnel of the gene of just genes replicating. And so they've been doing a lot of work on this. And I met uh, one of the founders of the field uh, named John Odling Smee, who's an Oxford professor uh, who created niche construction theory. And what we worked on, uh, and there's a book coming out from MIT Press, I think next year or the end of this year, uh, that revisits niche construction theory. So niche construction theory says a beaver builds a beaver lodge, totally changes the environment 
by creating a lake, which changes everything. And everything is codependent on that lodge being there, the dam being there. And everything grows up around niches being constructed to then promote changes in the living world. It's, it's hand in glove. And we literally had fireside chats for a couple of years here and in Oxford. And we worked out that perhaps this sludge that self-assembles is the proto-niche. And that niche construction is primal before life. So it's always been uh, proposed that niche construction is a, is a product of the living world, of, of, of organisms doing work, meaningful work that then creates the niche that then changes their environment. But if you look at the self-assembly of these membranous co uh, complexes, they already protect the interior from shear forces, temperature gradients, pH gradients. Uh, they stabilize their contents because of the polymer membrane interaction. So they are created, that's an environment, it's a niche actually. So in this chapter, what we're doing is promoting that niches actually came first. And that I'm, everything everything I'm, emerges within a, an appropriate niche. I'm almost certain that that has to be the case. Form informs everything that is downstream because the in, we we know that chemistry is the starting point because I think everybody agrees that before you have life, you have chemistry. And chemistry proceeds down thermodynamically favorable routes. And thermodynamically favorable routes change depending on your niche, right? Like we've been talking about pH. We've been talking about redox. We've been talking about the, the ionic chemistry of the waters in, in which we're functioning. And so we know that if you have one environment versus another, the reactions that are favorable in that environment will be different. And by the time that we get to the cell, that environment that has existed beforehand surely has changed tremendously, right? So from the moment that you start making your first protocell to the moment that you have your first bacterial cell, the outside environment has to change because we're talking about millions of years. And so there has to be a condition under which you're able to maintain, at least in some rudimentary form, for long enough, a niche in which something can happen and then react to the changes in the environment. And maybe that gradual chemical evolution in context of changes to water chemistry is the first rudimentary form. I think that it's probably what you're calling Dar pre-Darwinian selection. Now, now here's, here's another clue. If you go on a tourist trip to Yellowstone National Park, there are a number of, of geysers that just rise up out of buffalo meadows and these, these environments. If you go and you sit down next to the geyser, well, you'll notice there's an outflow channel. There's nothing in the geyser. It's too hot. There's just nothing living in there. But as soon as you get in the outflow channel, you, you can actually scoop out a kind of sludge, which is silica gel. Silica gel is coming out of a highly silicious alkaline environment. The silica gel, you can scoop it out. and as you get just below a certain temperature, there are hairs. And the hairs are thermophilic bacteria growing in and with and on the gel. And uh, work by Andrew Gangadeen at University of Cincinnati, he asked the question, does the gel make a sheath of silica or the, the microbes are in a chain, do they make a sheath of silica around them to protect them or does it naturally form? And I'm not sure what his, his results showed. But if you take uh, all of those hot spring microbial mats, those orange ones, those black ones, those green ones further down where photosynthesis can work, and you dry it down, it's 80 to 90 percent silica mineral by, by weight. So there's a clue there that the natural environment provided a matrix of protection just out of the physical process of silica coming out of solution, forming these gels that then entomb the microbes. And the tower that you're sitting on that is actually a tower of silica being deposited that can accept photosynthetic inputs down to about a meter. So the leaflets of all of this silica center are crammed with microbes. 
Well, what's crazy is that if you have these filamentary microbes that are inside of silica matrix, what it sounds to me is that you're making biowires. You're making bio bio light? Biowires. Right. So a lot of the a lot of my PhD work was about redox chemistry and it had to do with these quinone like compounds that are used by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And so what it can do is it can send out these molecules in different redox states. And when inside of a biofilm, those molecules actually serve as a signal for cell specialization. And so based off of the redox information that you're getting off of these diffusible molecules, you know that based off of where you are in the biofilm, this is the thing that you're supposed to do. And so it's kind of this rudimentary multicellularity that's inside of a bacterial biofilm. But it strikes me that the foundational principle for cellular organization has to be redox because that's going to be that's important for the stability of your DNA. It's important for the conditions under which the molecules can come together and hydrogen bonds and actually perform this chemistry. And so it strikes me that the thing that's been missing from this conversation that we've been having so far is the electrical component. Because electricity is inherent to the functionality of life. Like you look at what Michael Levin's doing and what Michael Levin is doing is he's you know, I thought at first he was applying exogenous electric fields, but he's not. What he's mm -hmm. doing is he's just changing the permissivity of, elect of, of ion channels in the membranes, and mm -hmm. that is sufficient to do it. And so we know that the electrochemical conditions that are inside of the cell are decisive for everything that happens downstream down to body plan. And so why haven't we been talking about electricity in this conversation yet? So the, the argument made by our vent colleagues is that, yes, these, these pH gradients that they propose for the vents being able to support this uh, are important. What the colleagues have done since they're working on protocells is to show two pH, almost three pH gradient changes or, or changes across membranes, creating an ex, uh, proton transport just by UV illuminating quinones or other polycyc or polycyclics that are meteorite derived. So it, it, it seems as though those, those gradients are available. And to capture that high quality energy, you know, perhaps proto-life starts by capturing wet dry cycling. It captures heat energy, which isn't very efficient, but it helps you along. It, it captures some redox sources in, in the environment. But then the capture of transmembrane, you know, especially polymer mediated. And so consider this. What if you had, I call it the Swiss Army knife argument, that Swiss Army knives could be broken up into many tools and the tools are sort of independent. This is in my TEDx talk, actually, if you look at it from eight, eight years ago. If they're, they're, they're just floating in the environment. So the scissors get together with the knife, get together with, you know, the the needle every once in a while but if they're in one body and they open up in in co-localize with each other this is the term for when polymers get attached to membranes co-localization so what if you had a, a rna a peptide uh, like chimera attached to a membrane which creates a transient dislocation which allows those protons to go back and forth and that on that is a is a uh, peptide mediated uh, template forming center. Well, the energy is going to be right there because you're you're stuck to the energy source. You're plugged in, and there are going to be compounds that are also in solution, but there are co compounds that it's encountering on the in the membrane itself. Could you build a system that can capture energy, uh, make a template that promotes the creation of that? new protopore that creates more protopores so it amplifies the system and there are synthetic biology models um, being worked on and some that have actually worked phil holliger's lab has developed such things but by being attached to the membrane you're plugged into the energy source potentially when you put all these pieces together with the quinones well what's really interesting there is that if you have a protopore whose function is to make protopores, you will eventually 
destroy your system because you can't have you need a pro this is what's so weird and jarring about this is because you need a system that makes the right amount of protopores and then once it's made the right amount of protopores some subset of those protopores start to make something else mm -hmm. that can then be used for the next downstream reaction right because the the importance for metabolism inside of a cell is to be able to have a separation between the inside and the outside and so if we're talking about the flow of protons through some kind of protopore, then what you're doing is you're equilibrating the gradient, you lose the gradient, you no longer have the mm -hmm. ability to do any kind of biochemistry. So, and so you have to go from pore to something else. And what is that? What is that? So Dave, Dave makes a really good point in that you'll notice in our, our hypothesis article, we propose a kind of stepwise emergence of these functions going from stabilizing polymers, which we've already demonstrated and other teams have, to protopores, which some teams are now working on. Let me, hold on one second. Let me, I, I, I want to make sure we get to, to all of this, but stabilizing polymers, you mean that when you add polymers to these vesicles, that they stabilize the system. Yeah. And so you're, you're ensuring this longevity. Yeah. Okay. And pores are being worked on because you can, you can make, uh, you can make pores that come together transiently, that where two two polymers or two molecules get close and they create this transient pore. There are a lot of ways to do passive pores. But then if you, you get further up, you get into informational polymers, you get into catalytics, you get into catalyzed reactions. Then, and what Dave points out, it's something that's almost never talked about in the synthetic bio top-down approach to minimum viable protocells. You need feedback controls. So we defined F polymers, polymers that slow the rates of reactions and then turn them back on. We need those. And in synthetic systems, it's really difficult to actually get those to work or to even study those. And that one proposal is that unless we do a pure evolutionary system, feedback polymers are going to be hard to design in. Wouldn't it's feedback polymers, wouldn't those just be buffers? They could be buffers or they could be distinct lock and key, like turn a, a, a protocode on off. Uh, now, what, what, we, what we can say, and this is in the hand-waving conjectural territory, is that if you get a really efficient pore that can make lots of copies of itself, it's going to have a rocking time for a short period of time before it, it becomes a liability. And then the protocell population will crash. And something, if something doesn't emerge that controls that next surge or mediates it, it will crash again and put, perhaps takes the entire system out of existence. So then the next try with the next protopore some, in some other warm little pond gets it right and that there's a mediating mechanism that comes from outside. And, and so selection has to take care of those issues. So we have to, in a sense, trust that selection will take care of those issues. One thing that I immediately think of is gated ion channels, right? So you can have an ion channel that has a little, I mean, from everything that I remember of protein biochemistry is that they're just these little flaps that basically just move up and they close the hole. And so all of a sudden you have something that is voltage controlled, which means that it's reacting to the electrochemical conditions of the cell. And so if you have the flap that can move in and out, all of a sudden now you have a tunable system, mm -hmm. which you're going from just free flow across a membrane to, hey, we, we have a way of opening and closing this that is controlled electrically and doesn't have to have any intelligence whatsoever. But now what you have is you have a system that's not going to go to catastrophic extinction and is able to maintain some kind of homeostatic condition from generation of wet-dry cycle. And Anastasia, you could definitely come in as a co-author on a beautiful paper just about this very, very subject, because this is the kind of thinking we need. We, 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 we have to assume that the progenote epoch of life, it looks and works really differently than a modern cell. And this is one of the mistakes that's made in, in looking through the lens of modern biology at protocell progenian biology. You have to rediscard much of what what we see as efficient machines mm. and just get to what Freeman Dyson called in some of our conversations, something just good enough, just good enough. 
And so even down to uh, protocell division. So here, here's a, a, a wonderful question at the very edge of the living world. Um, this is a thought experiment I did several years ago. What behooves a protocell to divide itself into daughter cells? What on earth is the benefit in a progeny and landscape where there's already plenty of replication going on? There's a rich system that's able to adapt. What the heck? And because a division of a protocell into daughter cells is a risky endeavor. Uh, some machinery starts up. Uh, there's a pinching down. Uh, the daughter, one daughter cell may be not viable, and then there's less material, less resources available in the original. And it just seems to be like a cumbersome and highly risky venture, energy driven venture, unless it's happening within the context of community. So if a division is attempted and fails inside the aggregate, uh, that material is not lost. If it happens, if it's attempted in solution, it's like cutting yourself from, you know, front to, to stern with a knife and just hoping that you'll create your offspring. It's just very, very risky. So then I asked the question, well, what are the pieces that have to come together to make cell division even a thing? And one of them is they all have to be uh, selection pressures or hurdles. One of the problems in the progenian epoch and the protocellular epoch is waste accumulation and byproducts. Mm. So we, we now have active pores to, we have enzymes to break them down. We've got active pores to discharge them. And we ourselves have a discharge elimination mechanism that we use all the time. And if we don't do it, we actually, we, we will pass away uh, within a matter of days. So elimination is important. So it's an important driver. Now, there is a simpler That, that form. puts a new urgency on constipation that I hadn't heard of before. A couple of days. <laughs> seems like a, a couple of days, timeline. yeah. Or maybe it's a week. I don't know. But it's, you know, if you go into nursing homes, you, you find there's a whole practice. And if people are not eliminating, they're getting sick really quickly. Yeah. So there is a simpler form of elimination, which is the pin pinching off of liposomes. Uh, this is often called like the exosomes that are have now been discovered and they're, they're, they're tracking this exosomosphere with enormous numbers of small compartments. Some of them are waste products. Some of them are nutrients and signaling mechanisms. It's what cells do. They pinch off these compartments that go off. Well, what if uh, there had been an evolutionary adaptation in the progenian that caused a pinching on one end of, of a protocell to you know, statistically capture more of the trash and take the trash out and leave just enough to make this system chemically more viable to get rid of these. Maybe a, a particular thing on a membrane collected the trash in one spot and then it pinched off and it was just selected for. So it was a tool that was, everybody was using. Well, what if it got uh, tied into the replicant machinery that's making copies of templates of heredity, hereditable materials, it's all still mostly attached to the membrane, and it got triggered so that it actually divided the entire compartment. So now you have two compartments with not identical, but a close match of, of a viable set, a minimally viable set. What, what advantages would that impart to that set of polymers? Well, a huge one because uh, you're now getting higher fidelity replication than was possible before in the huge intermixing system. You're preserving uh, resources right there that would have been lost into the into the mixing medium, into the aggregate, and you've undergone a phase transition that may actually benefit the entire colony, if you will. So now, uh, the say the epithelial layer of protocells is preferentially doing more pigment production. Now you've got speciation starting. But along the way, this the division process, the budding process, which was natural in the environment is now replaced by controlled division, isn't very efficient. It's like, it fails a lot of the time, but it doesn't really matter because it doesn't kill the original cell necessarily. 
and it doesn't remove those resources from the aggregate. So the ecosystem, the niche, doesn't get trashed by inefficient division. Any division at all will help create an epithelial layer of, of photo capture polymer uh, complexes that weren't there before. So the whole thing gets selected for, and now you're on the way in the direction of cell cellular fission. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I know it's I'm a really lot. Curious to, it's yeah, a lot I, have so, I have so many ideas about this. You have, I, I just, this is, I spend a lot of time thinking about this because this was a huge part of when I was writing my thesis. I was preoccupied with this question but I was studying biofilms and not the origin of life. And so I have been waiting for someone to 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 talk to about this for a very long time. <laughs> but go ahead. I'm, I'm kind of curious if there's a technological end game. Like if, if people are interested in putting this newfound understanding of how to originate life into practice, like, do you think people are interested in making little monsters or will it become part of Absolutely. growing new pieces of your body? Or is there is there any technological application of this research? Not that there has to be, but I'm, I'm always interested in, in how uh, that might transition. Two, two responses to that. The first is that there's already been a substantial industry generated from this, and that's nanopore sequencing. So Dave's work in the late 80s into the 90s uh, led to Oxford Nanopore being established around 2007 or 8. And now it's a $3 billion company that's challenging Illumina's dominance in, in uh, analysis and gene sequencing. It's a handheld device that uses hundreds of, of pores, specially designed pores. Uh, with they, they track the voltage, uh, voltage interrupts across the, the membrane, and they, the spike tells you what base it is. Really this cool is, technology. This is actually so they have this little uh, minion sequencer that mm -hmm. I have been I have been dreaming about because Shyla and I will go out into the woods and I have all these microbiological questions that I want to ask, but I don't have a sequencer and I don't have a sequencing facility, and so I'm always I, this is the one that I'm always talking to you about because you can take it and it's basically a field sequencer that lets you use small amounts of sample but get mm -hmm. very very good results because of this technology. Yeah, we need yeah, one of those. Yeah, it's it's wonderful, and it's on the space station. They sequence biofilms on the space station. It was used in uh, the Ebola outbreak in Africa. It's used for um, for COVID as well in the field, and so it's 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 a spinoff from Origins work. And the second answer is that this is fundamental science. This is fundamental biology, as fundamental as it gets for the twenty first century, and in a period of uh, over several years, a friend of mine, Ben Gertzel, I don't know, you should have Ben on your, your program. He's the father of AGI, artificial general intelligence, uh, the term itself, and held some of the first meetings. And they have a project called OpenCog. And he came down here during COVID uh, with his family, and they camped out in the meadow here. And we had a couple of days to talk. And what that led to was, so the problem in, in, in AI and things like chat GPT is they're just rigid, uh, very specialized. Uh, they're, they're not general purpose systems, right? So they're just, they're tools, but they're not general learning systems. So what he proposed on the Jim Rutt podcast last year was three paths to AGI. One path is let's model cognition for its own self block diagrams, cognitive processes, and let's try to do a high level map of what is a what is learning, what is cognition, what is what is where does the spark of genius come in that system? The second is let's model neurons. You know, and then the question is, do we have the compute to do that? And what are we leaving out? Are we leaving out microtubules? It's a vast, hard problem. The third, which really I think came from our conversations in my earlier PhD work, what about chemical systems that can learn? Protocells that in huge numbers, but not too huge that you can't you can't compute them, can pattern on an environment and start to express adaptations in, in this form of selection. So can in silicon, or maybe 
you know, who knows, uh, quantum computing in the future, can we create a substrate that is based upon how we think life began to create a general learning and adapting system? It has to be massively parallel, stochastic as heck. Uh, it has it can't be using von Neumann type bottlenecks. It can't be using Johnny von Neumann's design at all. It's like a reservoir computing system. It's something else. So we talked for a couple of days, and then uh, last year, I in Jim Rutt, in the second, I talked about implications of this work. And we had a meeting at, at Google in 2019 with their CTO office to say, is it possible that we need to rethink compute from the ground up? And this PIM cycle thing, that maybe is a good jump off point, is the starting point for rethinking uh, AI and machine learning. So if, if if we have time, I'll just jump, jump into the PIM model. Yeah, yeah, let's do the PIM model. So we've been talking for, you know, an hour and a half about protocells. So I did a thought experiment, you know, four or five years ago in which, you know, I do these sort of dream state thought experiments as some of my practice. And I asked like the big field that seems to be the best peer review system, like, okay, how are we made? And, uh, you know, based on my training and my predilections, I, I get some version of what I'm already working on back. But you close your eyes and then protocells form out of the background of physics. And the question came to me is, what is a protocell? What is a membranous enclosure? I said, well, uh, it's something that lets things in uh, that then become somehow differently related. And then, then a, a P a, a appeared, which was, what, what, do, what do we mean by P? I said, oh, it's a machine that increases, enhances probability. If things are stuck in a membranous enclosure, they got in there somehow, maybe they grew in size, they can't get out, or stuff is still coming in and out. Uh, they're more likely to encounter each other because they're in an enclosure. If they're in a rock pore with an open, open to the universe, it's, the P is way lower because of the flow through dynamics. But if it's a membranous enclosure, you're more likely to have the higher P. So things are more likely to uh, interact. Then the next thing that I saw in the dream was two protocells next to each other, with a little ledge between them, where things were jumping between the protocells. And it said, what is this? And I said, it's some kind of interaction because Stuff coming from outside, inside protocells is different than the stuff that is going between the protocells, two membranous boundaries. So then it populated a whole bunch of them, showing that the transmembrane connections between them create I, interconnection, a network. A network effect can arise within a protocell aggregate. I said, wow, that's pretty cool. What does this lead to? And then an M appeared which was memory. And the, the statement that I got from that was in such a system that increases the probability of interactions, you get local interactions. It allows it interconnect across where you get products from one diffusing into another node, which trigger another thing. And you have the formation of a nodal network that is cybernetic, which doesn't exist in the universe in ordinary stellar and planetary physics, this, this is new, you can get the arising of memory. Uh, can, you, can you explain cybernetic in this context? Cybernetic uh, feedback controls. Something starts, starts over here, it goes up, it comes in, it, it talks to the original thing and starts like your thermostat for your, 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 your furnace. Hmm. So Norbert Wiener and, and all. So PIM, so then the question was, well, what, is, what does this lead to? And I, it showed me the triangle P, I, and M, the dream. This was in the dream. And it started to spin. And as it spun, it spun off detrital material, like a, a vast, it spun off M's. It built larger interconnects, created more memories, and the probability uh, line was hockey sticking. As you, as you spin the system, it creates more of all of these properties. And it creates the living world. And it creates technology, it creates culture, and there is nothing outside of this system. And then I sort of thought to myself, well, the cell phone in my hand, this is a PIM device, this is PIM technology, because it's a node in a network that 
crowds data and algorithms together so they can interact. And it reads and writes a shit ton of memory. It's PIM. And this accelerates evolution. And that PIM perhaps is the underlying core algorithm underneath evolution. It's, it happens, it has to happen for combinatorial selection to start. And it has to happen way before Darwinian selection. So that in, when I presented this at Google, their interest was, oh, this is like a core core process. That if we had a, a trip, we took over the entire collab at Google and we created agents that did PIM. They're like chemical automata, but they do PIM not in isolation like a lot of A-life machine learning programs do. They are in exchange, like bacteria are, and clumps of these PIM agents attack a problem, a problem space. It's a different way to try to get signal out of that, that data, that big data that they're after. Initially, compute-wise, it would be really expensive because you're only able to funnel so many of these, these PIM agents through a von Neumann bottleneck, even if you have GPUs and all that sort of stuff. But if you refactored everything into uh, a reservoir pool of transistors that just runs PIM objects, it becomes more like a fluid environment. And if you gave it the magic touch, which I know you, you'll probably get to, which is a lot of chaos, a lot of shaking, don't try to do things procedurally and rigidly. Allow the environment to run stochastically, a lot of wiggling. No strict deterministic algorithms running, just encounters, probabilistic encounters, and see if that is a general learning system. You'll burn up a shit ton of compute power, but if you can demonstrate a system that doesn't matter what you throw it in terms of its underlying landscape, it will slowly adapt, and then it will build memories of how to adapt to the next thing you throw it, and it could be the various Catterwonky way of getting out of the von Neumann sort of hourglass trap that we're in and create new compute. And then the hardware engineers are going to have to come in and, well, you know, is there an economic model for any of this? But it, at least it would could be a proof of Ben Gertzel's third path to AGI. So, what is this von Neumann bottleneck that you've mentioned? Uh, it's literally that everything in a, in a compute space has to be broken down into instructions, data records, and go through a CPU and then be nice. dumped out. And John von Neumann, I did some work at the Institute for Advanced Study where they actually built, John von Neumann was there under the tutelage of Robert Oppenheimer when he was being hauled in front of those committees that you saw in the film. Uh, Oppenheimer had brought von Neumann in this group and built a building where they could build the first modern computer. And it launched in the summer of 1952, 52 to 53. Beautiful machine. They gave away the plans. And it basically had, you know, a bunch of memory where instructions and data could be both. And then instructions would come and pull from the data and run a program right through the, the CPU, which was all way with vacuum tubes. And they would dump out into another scratch memory. And they could actually see it in CRTs. They could see the compute field, but they could do weather stuff and stuff for the Department of Energy, the funders of the project. And I went through von Neumann's papers and found in one, one article that he said, we did something so that we could just get some work done. We didn't have to do a single patch cord, unlike the, you know, the Harvard Mark IV or whatever it was. Previous computing, you had to patch the program in and use switches, not with this machine. Uh, but it is in no way optimized for natural systems. And he understood this. And I had these conversations with Freeman about it, walked in the Institute Woods, just like you see in the movie, uh, that pond. And it was, I, was, I was constantly circling that pond, trying to figure out the frames problem where you, you're trying to compute the chemistry for life's origin. There's a protocell here, there's a polymer here, and you just can't do it. Because everything's simultaneous. And if you're forced to go down, make everything to a frame, compute it, and then change the the field after the compute is done, after you've touched each protocell, you're, you're just missing. You can't do it. Now, 
compute got really fast, so we can actually do reasonably good simulations, like for weather and prediction and stuff. But for the really hard problems involving general purpose learning, it's not going to cut it. Just because so, you can't process enough stuff in parallel, like you can't complex things together and process in multiple layers at once. You can run only a limited number of processes that don't reflect the full complexity of the interaction sphere. Precisely. Yeah. Okay. So if we had this magic compute medium, which was a lot like a natural system, uh, it we could tackle all kinds of different problems. So yeah, that reminds me of what Steve Grossberg was talking about. Steve Grossberg, he um, is a computational neuroscientist, and he came up with this adaptive resonance theory of consciousness. And he, along the way, has been suggesting that the problem with AGI is the fact that it doesn't have the ability to feed forward and feed back amongst multiple layers and multiple agents, mm -hmm. probably because of this exact problem that systems are designed by dint of limitation. And so yeah. his approach to the problem has always been that if you want to design systems that are actually conscious, that you do have to be able to have this real-time feedback mechanism. Otherwise, you're never going to get a true reflection of complexity. And and Ben's approach at the OpenCog project, I think has a new name now, is directed graphs. So getting away from uh, neural nets uh, with feedback and weights and things like that. And that's hard too. I mean, that's it's all hard. And so when I see the sort of panic and the moral panic about AI, I was like, guys, you know, we haven't even started on AGI. <laughs> no one's funding it. It's no It's never too early for moral panic. It's never too early for moral panic because certain people have certain advantages in, in that. But it's like the moral panic around, you know, telephones in 1915 or 10 or something that, you know, goodness gracious, it is a little bit of a waste of, of breath. But uh, we're we're not even on the road. We we haven't even gotten to step one on it. Something I mean, I th that Hollywood would, would depict, you know. I think that you you have touched on something, and we've been going, I think, for three hours at this point. So I think that we should f maybe start to start to find a pin. But I think that what you've demonstrated is that the origin of life has to be a network phenomenon as opposed to a cellular phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's very, very, very important and very key because when you talk about these differentiations of cellular behaviors inside of this wet-dry cycling where you begin to have speciation, you begin to have specialization, that's a, that's a biofilm. Mm -hmm. And we have the image of bacteria of the simplest forms of life as being independently living creatures that occasionally will form a biofilm. But the reality of the situation is that it's the exact opposite. It's that when we find them free floating, that's the anomalous condition. That's yeah. when they've been sloughed right. off, like these Precisely. protocells that have budded. Yeah. Yeah. And so it makes perfect sense that the beginning would have to be inside of this networked condition. And it also makes sense that that's so difficult for us to study because networks are hard. These are, these are things that the human mind can, can work with when they're at a certain scale. And then beyond that, you have to have computer models. And if our computers are designed in such a way that it's almost impossible to model these kinds of interactions, then we have both the perfect storm of not being able to solve a question, but also being on the precipice of pushing the technology far enough, fast enough to actually get to the point where we can solve it. And so it's all very is, exciting. This is why, and, 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 and thank you for crystallizing that thought so beautifully, Anastasia. Uh, this is why it in 2011, I was sitting on a park bench in Montpellier, France, at the Origin of Life meeting, the SL meeting, and realizing my entire work on my PhD, which I'd started you know, decades before in computing, was not going to be sufficient to simulate even the tiniest volume of the system that could give us sort of prediction uh, on Origin of Life. Uh, I, had, I had built a system that was you, you can look it up. It's called the Evolution Grid, and it had run for eight months at UC San Diego in a supercomputing array. And it demonstrated one thing, which is that stochastic hill climbing may be a universal phenomenon for the accumulation of complex stuff, and that it's it's a through line from cosmogenesis through biogenesis and up. Mm. And we did a 
basically a cosmochemistry simulation and trillions and trillions of virtual atoms <laughs> in small volumes to to find the optimal hill climbing algorithm. And then I realized, oh God, that's that's a property perhaps that we've we we've, we've discovered. Uh, but I need to switch to chemistry. Because in, in my lifetime, if we're going to see something, the molecules have to do the walking. And it was about that time, 2009, that I met Dave. And Dave showed me his simulation chamber. And he said, this is my, you know, original life chemical computer. And that's where our partnership began. And so all these years, it's been chemistry. Then we have to do it in realistic environments. We have to prove things and we have to do the analysis. And it's hard on its own, but coming back into compute in the 2020s, someone might be watching this episode or listening to the episode, and we've been starting to get graduate students and postdocs submitting papers to our, our journal special issue on computing these huge fields of protocells. And there will be a marriage between this massive uh, compute and machine that also is talking to a chemical engine just telling the chemical engine, inject this amount of amino acid and this amount of, you know, uh, lipid and do this cycling. And then it's literally looking at uh, a nanofluidics channel, a microfluidics channel, and it's looking at the sequencing coming out of it and saying, oh, we're getting signal. Our model predicts we will get a template working if we do this. And it does chemical search with real chemicals as the compute substrate with the model running on the side. And that will be our atom smasher. That will be the big science for creation, for the origin of life, $10 million or something like that to build that. Uh, and uh, maybe there's a potential donor in the wood woodwork out there listening to demystify science as well. But to build such a machine that's automated and closed loop to explore parameter space will accelerate this very hand done. It, it's there are so few tools for us and there's so little budget. You basically get two or three years of a graduate student or postdoc doing a particular line of things and it stops. Mm. The machine, the Genesis engine, maybe Mark II or Mark III, may be a way to really accelerate. Uh, and then, but we also have to say that engine should simulate prebiotically plausible environments on the early earth just because we could tag it to our planet uh but we could switch a, a a knob on the engine that says mars you know and suddenly there's more iron in there so who knows i mean it could be like a, a telescope on where life can begin if you think of the the grand scheme of things by mid-century or end of century I mean, that's a very cool vision. I love that it goes from something that is so theoretical and philosophical and ends on, hey, we can build something that will allow us to push forward the most foundational aspects of how we understand biology. Because I think that biology of the origin has always been plagued by being so difficult to work with. And biology in general strikes me as a discipline that needs platforms because we're so often preoccupied by things that are very, very small and very, very difficult to observe. And anyone who is building something that acknowledges that and then wants to deal with it is building something that is then going to serve as just the foundation for a huge amount of inquiry that we can't do right now because we just don't have the tools. And I, it's just, mm -hmm. it's very cool. It's very cool research. It's very cool. And Shiloh, I know you were grabbing the mic. Uh, I was just thinking about how it, it you know, one thing Mike Levin said that really had a big impression on me was you can have all of these ideas about something and you can come up with theories and hypotheses, but ultimately at the end of the day, people only start to care once you can do something with it. And that might be just moving the through some, you know, minefield in the theoretical landscape, or it might be a technological application. It seems like this work contributes to both, and that that makes it really exciting. Yeah, I, 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 you know, you can never tell what basic science produces, and this is true basic science. And in in some sense, I think we need to build the great observatory. You know, we have James Webb looking at the origin of the universe, basically. Uh, but this is the observatory that looks at the origin of life. It looks at biogenesis. 
And I think it can be seen as a great instrument. Uh, and it's really, it could be something, it could be built uh, in stages in, in five years, 10 years, coalesce incredible minds. This is what we're, our dream is for our Biota Institute and the partnership now with SETI, UC Santa Cruz and NASA and all the other universities. But it definitely, that's our call. Uh, will will people out there help us build this great observatory, this great instrument? Uh, and then there will be all the societal consequences and the the moral panic about where the, we're growing Franken bugs and you know they'll eat the earth and things like that. But you just sort of deal with that, and and then the you know the spiritual aspects. And I think I might have sent you a note that I believe that if if we witness protocell masses and how how fragile they are growing inside this engine, getting blown back by selection pressures like we crank up the UV, and then it crawls back near extinction. And we see uh, a bigger mass because of an adaptation, then there's a light goes off and the nanopore sequences said it just came up with this widget. And, and we will kind of like go team go. It's like, if that's how we began in some, if that's a simulacrum of how we began, Oh my gosh, there was so much against it. Because if you bring your picture out and you see that's on a pool in a landscape where there's acid rain falling, at impactors are happening, violent storms, like 30 feet tides, forget about the coastlines, it's massive storms all the time. It might have been a faint young sun, uh, high levels of radiation, an awful place that you would expire really quickly in. And then yet this fragile, little unit is pushing forward, pushing forward, pushing forward. And it might give us a kind of almost, I'd say, spiritual connection to we are unlikely. Because not only does, does this gelatinous blob have to become the first community uh, that is capable of, of surviving this horrible environment, it has to then remake the environment, turning it into a garden. It has to do the audacious thing of managing the temperature of the atmosphere to extend habitability. It then has to come up with innovations to deal with this toxin called oxygen that it's been cranking out uh, and use it as an energy source. It went through its own huge die-off and, and then it had impactors and it had freeze-over events in its future. And yet those little little guys made a garden world. You know, and the plants behind you there are, are only possible, and they're only possible for about 2 to 3% of Earth's history is complex life, and then it's going to fall off a cliff like Lovelock talks about. We're going to into Venus conditions in a few hundred million years. It's gone. No more uh, complex life. And so it's this, it gives us this exquisite sense of the fragility, rarity, and preciousness of all of this, and that our bodies are nothing more then the blob aggregates, again, they're communities. We live in communities. Communities in the soil support us. Community is primal, and the health of communities is constantly maintained because that's how life began. And there is competition, and it's a mechanism. The competition is only possible because of the huge community-supported substrate that lets it be possible. And yet communities don't decimate each other. Uh, in competition. They never do that. They use it as a mechanism. So we can kind of rebalance the whole red and tooth and claw argument and say that if Darwin had known uh, about this way that life can start in a warm little pond, if he had gone from San Cristobal Island in the Galapagos and he'd taken a small skiff or something to an adjacent island and gone and seen some hot springs, seen the bubbling hot little pond, maybe worked out a little bit more of, wow, this is a dynamic environment. And he would have potentially written a little bit more to, to Hooker in that letter saying, I, I feel that life is something even more profound than we can know. It's not just, you know, animal husbandry. It's not just finches competing and adapting. There's something inside more potent and parallel that is under our feet that we ought to look at too. Hmm. And so in a sense, we're, we're trying to sort of bring that out of the woodwork, if you will, 
into all the niche construction, into all the new rethinking of how to make a healthy civilization. And perhaps it's it's time, you know, 150 years later, um, in the 2020s, which could be, it could be a transformative idea that we started in community in deep uh, sharing adaptation. Uh, this is the fundamental beginning. This is what life is. Maybe it's transformative for the way humans think about what we do with each other and to each other and for each other. Mm. I hope I so. I love that. Yeah. I mean, there's much to think about. I hope that we have the opportunity to speak with you again. There's many questions that I still have that I haven't asked, but, you know, a little bit at a time. It's it's a really fascinating subject, and I think that it reaches into, like you said, the very depths of nature. And so we will certainly revisit it and hope to see where you are a little bit farther down the road. And we're looking for collaborators. So if you want to keep thinking about this, maybe you can join our... our uh, progenitor uh, paper series That'd because be if, you, if you have a background in biofilms to bring everything through that lens it could be very very valuable for the for the community yeah i would love to we can we i'll send an email offline and anastasia has has formally joined the faculty now at sou <laughs> yeah. with with me so uh she has an academic affiliation finally she can publish yeah microbiology will not let me go so i'm teaching microbiology this fall and um uh, Going out to Yellowstone and sitting next to, I think it's called Steep Cone, Flat Cone Geyser, and seeing it's all there in front of you. Yeah. The abiotic world, then this incredible prebiotic, no, no photozone world with mineral as the EPS, the, the extra polymeric substance, and the little tendrils of life in there. And then all the way down to the photosynthetic zone of one outflow channel. And you can scoop this stuff up and then the stuff in the rocks. It's literally the story of life's origin and evolution is sitting in front of you in a, in a 10 foot thing. You can sit and commune with it and study it all day. And then you look out and you see, you know, the fir forest, you see buffaloes over there and this huge meadow. But what you're sitting on is, this, and it's producing a huge amount of oxygen. So the thing is an oxygen factory that helped uh, create the create the conditions for everything in Buffalo Meadow. So uh, it sounds like a field trip is in order. So what what I want to end with is this idea that, that you had Anastasia, which is that we can't re divorce things from the environment. And I would agree in that Dave was the only person in our field that was going out of the laboratory. Uh, in 2005, we went to Kamchatka and poured chemicals in, in a hydrothermal pool on, at Mount Mudnovsky, riding a Russian helicopter and having a shotgun for grizzly bears. And, and once we started going out of clean glassware and Merck chemicals and all that sort of stuff and into the field, the environment started to teach us and wake us up. And then when we went to the ancient rocks that I shared, it taught us even more. And if there's a call for our colleagues everywhere, or people who are working on things, go and let the, the natural environment be your teacher and your guide. Because if, there's no way you can think up, up stuff in your head that's so complex. And it's all still there. It's still running as it was billions of years ago. And, you know, just as rainforest ecologists would not stay in the lab, uh, people working on fu this fundamental question ought to go to the field. A oh, thousand percent. I, I can't, I have no idea how people in New York City come up with scientific ideas because I, I've never had a, a good scientific idea when I'm not in the woods, essentially. Right, right. They're all mathematicians and marketeers. <laughs> uh, Actually, that explains a lot now that I think about it. You might be onto something there. I think that I think we should just put a pin. We could keep talking all day, but you've given us so much of your time. It has been absolutely fascinating. Thank and, you, and uh, I hope the recording comes out, the audio is good, and uh, look forward to seeing and hearing the podcast. And if anyone wants to reach me, uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, Biota Origins, B-I-O-T-A Origins, at gmail.com is our institution site, and you can just go to biota.org and see 
our field work, documentaries that have been produced, tons of papers, news articles, con controversy around the ocean vents to the hydrothermal fields on land. It's all there. And uh, we're looking for uh, new postdocs uh, that we can bring in for mentoring and working in, the, in our labs. And so if anybody is at that kind of career point and has, uh, you know, get in touch with me because we're in the market for our next uh, research scholars. Fantastic. Very cool. Thank you so much, Bruce. It was wonderful. You're so welcome. Have a great rest of your day, sir. Thank you. You too. Right. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye.